The Main Woods by Henry David Thoreau Chapter 1 Katahdin On the 31st of August, 1846, I left Concord in Massachusetts for Bangor on the backwoods of Maine by way of the railroad and steamboat, intending to accompany a relative of mine engaged in the lumber trade in Bangor, as far as a dam on the west branch of the Penobscot in which property he was interested. From this place, which is about 100 miles by the river above Bangor, 30 miles from the Holton Military Road, and 5 miles beyond the last log hut, I propose to make excursions to Mount Katahdin, the second highest mountain in New England, about 30 miles distant, and to some of the lakes of the Penobscot, either alone or with such company as I might pick up there. It is unusual to find a camp so far in the woods at that season when lumbering operations have ceased, and I was glad to avail myself of the circumstance of a gang of men being employed there at that time in repairing the injuries caused by the great freshet in the spring. The mountain may be approached more easily and directly on horseback and on foot from the northeast side by the Aroostook Road and the Wasatiquak River, but in that case you see much less of the wilderness, none of the glorious river and lake scenery, and have no experience of the bateau and the boatman's life. I was fortunate also in the season of the year for in the summer myriads of black flies, mosquitoes, and midges, or as the Indians call them, no seams, make traveling in the woods almost impossible. But now their reign was nearly over. Katahdin, whose name is an Indian word signifying highest land, was first ascended by white men in 1804. It was visited by Professor J. W. Bailey of West Point in 1836, by Dr. Charles T. Jackson, the state geologist, in 1837, and by two young men from Boston in 1845. All these have given accounts of their expeditions. Since I was there, two or three other parties have made the excursion and told their stories. Besides these, very few, even among backwoodsmen and hunters, have ever climbed it, and it will be a long time before the tide of fashionable travel sets that way. The mountainous region of the state of Maine stretches from near the White Mountains, northeasterly 160 miles, to the head of the Aroostook River and is about 60 miles wide. The wild or unsettled portion is far more extensive, so that some hours only of travel in this direction will carry the curious to the verge of a primitive forest more interesting, perhaps on all accounts, than they would reach by going a thousand miles westward. The next forenoon, Tuesday, September 1st, I started with my companion in a buggy from Bangor for upriver, expecting to be overtaken the next day night at Matawamkeg Point, some 60 miles off by two more Bangorians who had decided to join us in a trip to the mountain. We had each a knapsack or bag filled with such clothing and articles as were indispensable, and my companion carried his gun. Within a dozen miles of Bangor, we passed through the villages of Stillwater and Old Town, built at the falls of the Penobscot, which furnish the principal power by which the main woods are converted into lumber. The mills are built directly over and across the river, here is a close jam, a hard rub at all seasons, and then the one green tree, long since white, I need not say as the driven snow, but as a driven log becomes lumber merely. Here your inch, your two, and your three inch stuff begin to be, and Mr. Sawyer marks off those spaces which decide the destiny of so many prostrate forests. 
Through this steel riddle, more or less coarse, is the arrowy main forest from Katahdin and Chizunkuk and the headwaters of the St. John, relentlessly sifted till it comes out boards, clapboards, lathes, and shingles such as the wind can take, still perchance to be slit and slit again till men get a size that will suit. Think how stood the white pine tree on the shore of Chizunkuk, its branches soughing with the four winds, and every individual needle trembling in the sunlight. Think how it stands with it now, sold, perchance, to the New England Friction Match Company. There were, in 1837, as I read, 250 sawmills on the Penobscot and its tributaries above Bangor, the greater part of them in this immediate neighborhood, and they saw 200 millions of feet of boards annually. To this is to be added the lumber of the Kennebec, Androscoggin, Saco, Passamaquoddy, and other streams. No wonder that we hear so often of vessels which are becalmed off our coast, being surrounded a week at a time by floating lumber from the main woods. The mission of men there seems to be, like so many busy demons, to drive the forest all out of the country, from every solitary beaver swamp and mountainside as soon as possible. At Old Town, we walked into a bateau manufactory. The making of bateau is quite a business here for the supply of the Penobscot River. We examined some on the stocks. They are light and shapely vessels, calculated for rapid and rocky streams, and to be carried over long portages on men's shoulders from twenty to thirty feet long, and only four or four and a half wide, sharp at both ends like a canoe, though broadest forward on the bottom, and reaching seven or eight feet over the water, in order that they may slip over rocks as gently as possible. They are made very slight, only two boards to a side, commonly secured to a few light maple or other hardwood knees, but inward are of the clearest and widest white pine stuff, of which there is a great waste on account of their form, for the bottom is left perfectly flat, not only from side to side, but from end to end. Sometimes they become hogging, even after long use, and the boatmen then turn them over and straighten them by a weight at each end. They told us that one wore out in two years, or often in a single trip, on the rocks, and sold for f from 14 to $16. There was something refreshing and wildly musical to my ears in the very name of the white man's canoe, reminding me of a Charlevoix and Canadian voyageurs. The bateau is a sort of mongrel between the canoe and the boat, a fur trader's boat. The ferry here took us past the Indian island. As we left the shore, I observed a short, shabby washerwoman looking Indian. They commonly have the woebegone look of the girl that cried for spilt milk just from upriver, land on the old town side near a grocery, and drawing up his canoe, take out a bundle of skins in one hand and an empty keg or half barrel in the other and scramble up the bank with them. This picture will do to put before the Indian's history, that is, the history of his extinction. In 1837, there were 362 souls left of this tribe. The island seemed deserted today, yet I observed some new houses among the weather-stained ones, as if the tribe had still a design upon life. But generally, they have a very shabby, forlorn, and cheerless look, being all backside and woodshed, not homesteads, even Indian homesteads. But instead of home or abroad steads, for their life is domai out, Militi, at home or at war, or now rather venatus, 
that is, a hunting, and most of the latter. The church is the only trim-looking building, but that is not Abenaki. That was Rome's doing. Good Canadian, it may be, but it is poor Indian. These were once a powerful tribe. Politics are all the rage with them now. I even thought that a row of wigwams with a dance of powwows and a prisoner tortured at the stake would be more respectable than this. We landed in Milford and rode along on the east side of the Penobscot, having a more or less constant view of the river and the Indian islands in it, for they retain all the islands as far up as Nicotau at the mouth of the east branch. They are generally well timbered and are said to be better soil than the neighboring shores. The river seemed shallow and rocky and interrupted by rapids rippling and gleaming in the sun. We paused a moment to see a fish hawk dive for a fish down straight as an arrow from a great height, but he missed his prey this time. It was the Holton Road on which we were now traveling, over which some troops were marched once towards Mars Hill, though not to Mars Field, as it proved. It is the main, almost the only, road in these parts, as straight and well-made and kept in as good repair as almost any you will find anywhere. Everywhere we saw signs of the great freshet. This house standing awry, and that where it was not founded, but where it was found. At any rate, the next day, and that other with a waterlogged look, as if it were still airing and drying its basement and logs with everybody's marks upon them, and sometimes the marks of their having served as bridges strewn along the road. We crossed the Sunkazi, a summary Indian name, the Oliman, Pasadumkeg, and other streams which make a greater show on the map than they did now on the road. At, at Pasadumkeg we found anything but what the name implies. Earnest politicians, to wit, white ones, I mean, on the alert to know how the election was likely to go. Men who talked rapidly with subdued voice and a sort of factitious earnestness you could not help believing, hardly waiting for an introduction, one on each side of your buggy, endeavoring to say much in little, for they see you hold the whip impatiently, but always saying little and much. Caucasus they have had, it seems, and Caucasus they are to have again, victory and defeat. Somebody may be elected, somebody may not. One man, a total stranger, who stood by our carriage in the dusk, actually frightened the horse with his asservations, growing more solemnly positive as there was less in him to be positive about. So Pasadumkeg did not look on the map. At sundown, leaving the river road a while for shortness, we went by way of Enfield, where we stopped for the night. This, like most of the localities bearing names on this road, was a place to name which, in the midst of the unnamed and unincorporated wilderness, was to make a distinction without a difference, it seemed to me. Here, however, I noticed quite an orchard of healthy and well-grown apple trees, in a bearing state, it being the oldest settler's house in this region, but all natural fruit and comparatively worthless for want of a grafter. And so it is generally lower down the river. It would be a good speculation as well as a favor conferred on the settlers for a Massachusetts boy to go down there with a trunk full of choice scions and his grafting apparatus in the spring. The next morning we drove along through a high and hilly country in view of Cold Stream Pond, a beautiful lake four or five miles long, and came into the Holton Road again, here called the Military Road, at Lincoln, 45 miles from Bangor, where there is quite a village for this country, the principal one above Old Town. 
Learning that there were several wigwams here on one of the Indian islands, we left our horse and wagon and walked through the forest half a mile to the river to procure a guide to the mountain. It was not till after considerable search that we discovered their habitations, small huts in a retired place where the scenery was unusually soft and beautiful, and the shore skirted with pleasant meadows and graceful elms. We paddled ourselves across to the island side in a canoe, which we found on the shore. Near where we landed sat an Indian girl, ten or twelve years old, on a rock in the water, in the sun, washing and humming or moaning a song meanwhile. It was an aboriginal strain. A salmon spear made wholly of wood lay on the shore, such as they might have used before white men came. It had an elastic piece of wood fastened to one side of its point, which slipped over and closed upon the fish, somewhat like the contravance for holding a bucket at the end of a well pole. As we walked up the nearest house, we were met by a sally of a dozen wolfish-looking dogs, which may have been lineal descendants from the ancient Indian dogs, which the first voyagers describe as their wolves. I suppose they were. The occupant soon appeared with a long pole in his hand, with which he beat off the dogs while he parlayed with us a stalwart but dull and greasy-looking fellow, who told us in his sluggish way, in answer to our questions, as if it were the first serious business he had to do that day, that there were Indians going upriver, he and one other, today before noon. And who was the other? Louis Neptune, who lives in the next house. Well, let us go over and see Louis together. The same doggish reception, and Louis Neptune makes his appearance, a small, wiry man with puckered and wrinkled face, yet he seemed the chief man of the two, the same, as I remembered, who had accompanied Jackson to the mountain in 37. The same questions were put to Louis, and the same information obtained, while the Indians stood by. It appeared that they were going to start by noon with two canoes to go up to Chisuncook to hunt moose to be gone a month. Well, Louis, suppose you get to the point, to the five islands just below Matawamkeg, to camp. We walk on up the west branch tomorrow, four of us, and wait for you at the dam or this side. You overtake us tomorrow or next day and take us into your canoes. We stop for you, you stop for us. We pay you for your trouble. Yay, replied Louis. Maybe you carry some provision for all, some pork, some bread, and so pay. He said, me sure get some moose. And when I asked if he thought Pamela would let us go up, he answered that we must plant one bottle of rum on the top. He had planted a good many, and when he looked again, the rum was all gone. He had been up two or three times. He had planted letter, English, German, French, etc. These men were slightly clad in shirt and pantaloons, like laborers with us in warm weather. They did not invite us into their houses, but met us outside. So we left the Indians, thinking ourselves lucky to have secured such guides and companions. There were very few houses along the road, yet they did not altogether fail, as if the law by which men are dispersed over the globe were a very stringent one, and not to be resisted with impunity for, or for slight reasons. There were even the germs of one or two villages just beginning to expand. The beauty of the road itself was remarkable, the various evergreens, many of which are rare with us, delicate and beautiful specimens of the larch, arbor vitae, ball spruce, and fir balsam, from a few inches to many feet in height, lined its sides, in some places like a long front yard, springing up from the smooth grass plots, 
which uninterruptedly border it, and are made fertile by its wash. While it was but a step on either hand to the grim, untrodden wilderness whose tangled labyrinth of living, fallen, and decaying trees, only the deer and moose, the bear and wolf can easily penetrate. More perfect specimens than any front yard plot can show grew there to grace the passage of the Holton teams. About noon, we reached the Mattawamkeg, 56 miles from the Bangor by the way we had come, and put up a frequented house still on the Holton Road, where the Holton stage stops. Here was a substantial covered bridge over the Mattawamkeg, built, I think they said, some 17 years before. We had dinner, where, by the way, and even at breakfast, as well as supper, at the public houses on this road, the front rank is composed of various kinds of sweet cakes, in a continuous line from one end of the table to the other. I think I may safely say that there was a row of ten or a dozen plates of this kind set before us two here. To account for which, they say that when the lumberers come out of the woods, they have such a craving for cakes and pies and such sweet things, which there are almost unknown, and this is the supply to satisfy that demand. The supply is always equal to the demand, and these hungry men think a good deal of getting their money's worth. No doubt the balance of victuals is restored by the time they reach Bangor. Madawan Keg takes off the raw edge. Well, over this front rank, I say, you coming from the sweet cake side, with a cheap philosophic indifference, though it may be, have to assault what there is behind, which I do not by any means mean to insinuate is insufficient in quantity or quality to supply that other demand of men, not from the woods, but from the towns for venison and strong country fare. After dinner, we strolled down to the point, formed by the junction of two rivers, which is said to be the scene of an ancient battle between the eastern Indians and the Mohawks, and searched there carefully for relics, though the men at the bar room had never heard of such things. But we found only some flakes of arrowhead stones, some points of arrowheads, one small leaden bullet, and some colored beads, the last to be referred, perhaps, to early fur trader days. The Mattawamkeg, though wide, was a mere river's bed, full of rocks and shallows at this time, so that you could cross it almost dry-shod in boots, and I could hardly believe my companion when he told me that he had been fifty or sixty miles up it in a bateau through distant and still uncut forests. A bateau could hardly find a harbor now at its mouth. Deer and caribou or reindeer are taken here in the winter in sight of the house. Before our companions arrived, we rode on up the Holton Road seven miles to Malonkis, where the Aroostook Road comes into it, and where there is a spacious public house in the woods called the Malonkis House, kept by one Libby, which looked as if it had its hall for dancing and for military drills. There was no other evidence of man but this huge shingle palace in this part of the world, but sometimes even this is filled with travelers. I looked off the piazza, round the corner of the house, up the Aroostook Road, on which there was no clearing in sight. There was a man just adventuring upon it this evening in a rude original, what you may call a rustic wagon. A mere seat with a wagon swung under it, a few bags on it, and a dog asleep to watch them. He offered to carry a message for us to anybody in that country cheerfully. I suspect that if you should go to the end of the world, you would find somebody there going farther, as if it had just started for home at sundown and having a last word before he drove off. 
Here, too, was a small trader, whom I did not see at first, who kept a store. But no great store, certainly, in a small box over the way behind the Malunkus signpost. It looked like the balance box of a patent hay scales. As for his house, we could only conjecture where that was. He may have been a boarder in the Malunkus house. I saw him standing in his shop door. His shop was so small that if a traveler should make demonstrations of entering in, he would have to go out by the back way and confer with his customer through a window about his goods in the cellar or, more probably, bespoken and yet on the way. I should have gone in, for I felt a real impulse to trade, if I had not stopped to consider what would become of him. The day before, we had walked into a shop over against an inn where we stopped. The puny beginning of trade, which would grow at last into a firm co-partnership in the future town or city. Indeed, it was already somebody and company. I forget who. The woman came forward from the penetralia of the attached house for somebody and company. Was in the burning, and she sold us percussion caps, canals, and smooth and knew their prices and qualities, and which the hunters preferred. Here was a little of everything in a small compass to satisfy the wants and the ambition of the woods, a stock selected with wet pains and care, and brought home in the wagon box or a corner of the Holton team. But there seemed to me, as usual, a preponderance of children's toys, dogs to bark and cats to meow, and trumpets to blow, where natives there hardly are yet. As if a child born into the main woods among the pine cones and cedar berries could not do without such a sugar man or skipping jack as the young Rothschild has. I think that there was not more than one house on the road to Malunkus, or for seven miles. At that place we got over the fence into a new field, planted with potatoes where the logs were still burning between the hills, and, pulling up the vines, found good-sized potatoes, nearly ripe, growing like weeds, and turnips mixed with them. The mode of clearing and planting is to fell the tree, and burn once what will burn, then cut them up into suitable lengths, roll into heaps, and burn again, then with a hoe, plant potatoes where you can come at the ground between the stumps and charred logs. For a first crop, the ashes sufficing for manure and no hoeing being necessary the first year. In the fall, cut, roll, and burn again, and so on till the land is cleared, and soon it is ready for grain and to be laid down. Let those talk of poverty and hard times who will in the towns and cities cannot the emigrant who can pay for his fare to New York or Boston pay five dollars more to get here? I paid three, all told, for my passage from Boston to Bangor, two hundred and fifty miles, and be as rich as he pleases where land virtually co costs nothing and houses only the labor of building, and he may begin life as Adam did. If he will still remember the distinction of poor and rich, let him bespeak him a narrower house forthwith. When we returned to the Matamomkeg, the Holton stage had already put up there, and a province man was betraying his greenness to the Yankees by his questions. Why province money won't pass here at par when state's money is good at Fredericton, though this perhaps was sensible enough. From what I saw then, it appears that the province man was now the only real Jonathan, or raw country bumpkin, left so far behind by his enterprising neighbors that he didn't know enough to put a question to them. 
No people can long continue provincial in character who have the propensity for politics and whittling and rapid traveling which the Yankees have, and who are leaving the mother country behind in the variety of their notions and inventions. The possession and exercise of practical talent merely are a sure and rapid means of intellectual culture and independence. The last edition of Greenleaf's Map of Maine hung on the wall here, and as we had no pocket map, we resolved to trace a map of the lake country. So, dipping a wad of tow into the lamp, we oiled a sheet of paper on the oiled tablecloth, and in good faith traced what we, were, what we afterwards ascertained to be a labyrinth of errors carefully following the outlines of the imaginary lakes which the map contains. The map of the public lands of Maine and Massachusetts is the only one I have seen that at all deserves the name. It was while we were engaged in this operation that our companions arrived. They had seen the Indians fire on the five islands, and so we concluded that all was right. Early the next morning, we had mounted our packs and prepared for a tramp up the west branch, my companion having turned his horse out to pasture for a week or ten days, thinking that a bite of fresh grass and a taste of running water would do him as much good as backwoods fare and a new country influences his master. Leaping over a fence, we began to follow an obscure trail up the northern bank of the Penobscot. There was now no road further, the river being the only highway, and but half a dozen log huts confined to its banks, to be met with for thirty miles. On either hand and beyond was a wholly in uninhabited wilderness stretching to Canada, Neither horse nor cow nor vehicle of any kind had ever passed over this ground, the cattle and the few bulky articles which the loggers used, being got up in the winter on the ice and down again before it breaks. The evergreen woods had a decidedly sweet and bracing fragrance. The air was a sort of diet drink, and we walked on buoyantly in Indian file, stretching our legs. Occasionally, there was a small opening on the bank made for the purpose of log rolling, where we got a sight of the river, always a rocky and rippling stream. The roar of the rapids, the note of a whistler duck on the river, of the jay and chickadee around us, and of the pigeon woodpecker in the openings were the sounds that we heard. This was what you might call a brand new country. The only roads were of nature's making and the few houses were camps. Here, then, one could no longer accuse institutions and society but must front the true source of evil. There are three classes of inhabitants who either frequent or inhabit the country which we had now entered. First, the loggers who, for a part of the year, the winter and spring, are far the most numerous, but in the summer, except a few explorers for timber, completely deserted. Second, the few settlers I have named, the only permanent inhabitants, who live on the verge of it and help raise supplies for the former. Third, the hunters, mostly Indians, who range over it in their season. At the end of three miles, we came to the Matasunk stream and mill, where there was even a rude wooden railroad running down to the Penobscot, the last railroad we were to see. We crossed one tract, on the bank of the river of more than a hundred acres of heavy timber which had just been felled and burnt over and was still smoking. Our trail lay through the midst of it and was well nigh blotted out. The trees lay at full length, four or five feet deep, 
and crossing each other in all directions, all black as charcoal, but perfectly sound within, still good for fuel or for timber. Soon they would be cut into lengths and burnt again. Here were thousands of cords, enough to keep the poor of Boston and New York amply warm for a winter, which only cumbered the ground and were in the settler's way. And the whole of that solid and interminable forest is doomed to be gradually devoured thus by fire, like shavings, and no man be warmed by it. At Crocker's Log Hut, at the mouth of Salmon River, seven miles from the point, one of the party commenced distributing a store of small scent picture books among the children to teach them to read, and also newspapers, more or less recent, among the parents, than which nothing can be more acceptable to a backwoods people. It was really an important item in our outfit, and at times the only currency that would circulate. I walked through Salmon River with my shoes on, it being low water, but not without wetting my feet. A few miles farther we came to Marm Howard's, at the end of an extensive clearing, where there were two or three log huts in sight at once one on the opposite side of the river, and a few graves, even surrounded by a wooden paling, where already the rude forefathers of a hamlet lie, and a thousand years hence, perchance some poet will write his elegy in a country churchyard. The village Hamptons, the mute and glorious Miltons, and Cromwell's guiltless of their country's blood were yet unborn. Quote, Perchance in this wild spot there will be laid some heart once pregnant with celestial fire, hands that the rod of empire might have swayed or waked to ecstasy the living Lear. Unquote. The next house was Fisk's. Ten miles from the point at the mouth of the East Branch, opposite to the island Nicotau, or the Forks, the last of the Indian Islands. I am particular to give the names of the settlers and the distances, since every log hut in these woods is a public house, and such information is of no little consequence to those who may have occasion to travel this way. Of course, here crossed the Penobscot and followed the southern bank. One of the party who entered the house in search of someone to set us over reported a very neat dwelling with plenty of books and a new wife just imported from Boston, wholly new to the woods. We found the East Branch, a large and rapid stream at its mouth and much deeper than it appeared having with some difficulty discovered the trail branch again. We kept up the south side of, of the west branch, or main river, passing by some rapids called Rock Ebeam, the roar of which we heard through the woods, and shortly after, in the thickest of the wood, some empty loggers' camps, still new, which were occupied the previous winter. Though we saw a few more afterwards, I will make one account serve for all. These were such houses as the lumberers of Maine spend the winter in, in the wilderness. There were the camps and the hovels for the cab cattle, hardly distinguishable except that the latter had no chimney. These camps were about 20 feet long by 15 feet wide, built of logs, hemlock, cedar, spruce, or yellow birch. One kind alone, or all together, with the bark on, two or three large ones first, one directly above another and notched together at the ends, to the height of three or four feet, then of smaller logs resting upon transverse ones at the ends, each of the last successively shorter than the other to form the roof. The chimney was an oblong square hole in the middle, 
three or four feet in diameter with a fence of logs as high as the ridge. The interstices were filled with moss and the roof was shingled with long and handsome splints of cedar or spruce or pine rifted with a sledge and cleaver. The fireplace, the most important place of all, was in shape and size like the chimney and directly under it defined by a log fence or fender on the ground and a heap of ashes a foot or two deep within with solid benches of split logs running around it. Here the fire usually melts the snow and dries the rain before it can descend to quench it. The faded beds of arbor vitae leaves extended under the eaves on either hand. There was the place for the water pail, pork barrel, and wash basin, and generally a dingy pack of cards left on a log. Usually a good deal of whittling was expended on the latch, which was made of wood in the form of an iron one. These houses are made comfortable by the huge fires which can be afforded night and day. Usually the scenery about them is drear and savage enough, and the loggers camp is as completely in the woods as a fungus at the foot of a pine in a swamp. No outlook but to the sky overhead. No more clearing than is made by cutting down the trees of which it is built and those which are necessary for fuel. If only it be well sheltered and convenient to his work, and near a spring he wastes no thought on the prospect. They are very proper forest houses, the stems of the trees collected together and piled up around a man to keep out wind and rain, made of living green logs, hanging with moss and lichen, and with the curls and fringes of the yellow birch bark, and dripping with resin, fresh and moist, and redolent of swampy odors, with that sort of vigor and perennialness even about them that toadstools suggest. The logger's fare consists of tea, molasses, flour, pork, sometimes beef, and beans. A great proportion of the beans raised in Massachusetts find their market here. On expeditions, it is only hard bread and pork, often raw, slice upon slice, with tea or water, as the case may be. The primitive wood is always and everywhere damp and mossy, so that I traveled constantly with the impression that I was in a swamp and only when it was remarked that this or that tract, judging from the quality of the timber on it, would make a profitable clearing, was I reminded that if the sun were let in, it would make a dry field, like the few I had seen at once. The best shod, for the most part, travel with wet feet, if the ground was so wet and spongy at this, the driest part of a dry season, what must it be in the spring? The woods hereabouts abounded in beech and yellow birch, of which last there was some very large specimens, also spruce, cedar, fir, and hemlock. But we saw only the stumps of the white pine here, some of them of great size, these having been already called out, being the only tree much sought after, even as low down as this. Only a little spruce and hemlock beside had been logged here. The eastern wood which is sold for fuel in Massachusetts all comes from below Bangor. It was the pine alone, chiefly the white pine, that had tempted any but the hunter to precede us on this route. Waits Farm, 13 miles from the point, is an extensive and elevated clearing from which we got a fine view of the river rippling and gleaming far beneath us. My companions had formerly had a good view of Katahdin and the other mountains here, but today it was so smoky that we could see nothing of them. We could overlook an immense country of uninterrupted forest stretching away up the east branch toward Canada on the north and northwest 
and toward the Aroostook Valley on the northeast, and imagine what wildlife was stirring in its midst. Here was quite a field of corn for this region, whose peculiar dry scent we perceived a third of a mile off before we saw it. Eighteen miles from the point brought us in sight of McCausland's, or Uncle George's, as he was familiarly called by my companions, to whom he was well known, where we intended to break our long fast. His house was in the midst of an extensive clearing of intervale at the mouth of the Little Scudic River on the opposite or north bank of the Penobscot. So we collected on a point of the shore that we might be seen and fired our gun as a signal, which brought out his dogs forthright, and thereafter their master, who in due time took us across in his bateau. This clearing was bounded abruptly on all sides but the river, by the naked stems of the forest, as if you were to cut only a few feet square in the midst of a thousand acres of mowing, and set down a thimble therein. He had a whole heaven and horizon to himself, and the sun seemed to be journeying over his clearing only the livelong day. Here we concluded to spend the night and wait for the Indians, as there was no stopping place so convenient above. He had seen no Indian pass, and this did not often happen without his knowledge. He thought that his dogs sometimes gave notice of the approach of Indians half an hour before they arrived. McCausland was a Kennebec man of Scotch descent, who had been a waterman twenty-two years and had driven on the lakes and headwaters of the Penobscot five or six springs in succession, but was now settled here to raise supplies for the lumberers and for himself. He entertained us a day or two with true Scotch hospitality and would accept no recompense for it. A man of a dry wit and shrewdness and a general intelligence which I had not looked for in the backwoods. In fact, the deeper you penetrate into the woods, the more intelligent and, in one sense, less countrified do you find the inhabitants, for always the pioneer has been a traveler, and to some extent a man of the world, and as the distances with which he is familiar are greater, so is his information more general and far-reaching than the villagers. If I were to look for a narrow, uninformed, and countrified mind, as opposed to the intelligence and refinement which are thought to emanate from cities, it would be among the rusty inhabitants of an old, settled country. On farms all run out and gone to seed with life everlasting, in the towns about Boston, even on the high road in Concord, and not in the backwoods of Maine. Supper was got before our eyes in the ample kitchen by a fire which would have roasted an ox. Many whole logs, four feet long, were consumed to boil our tea kettle. Birch or beech or maple, the same summer and winter, and the dishes were soon smoking on the table, laid the armchair against the wall from which one of the party was expelled. The arms of the chair formed the frame on which the table rested, and when the round top was turned up against the wall, it formed the back of the chair and was no more in the way than the wall itself. This, we noticed, was the prevailing fashion in these log houses in order to economize in, our, in room. There were piping hot wheaten cakes, the flour having been brought up the river in Beto, no Indian bread, for the upper part of Maine, it will be remembered, is a wheat country, and ham, eggs, and potatoes, and milk, and cheese, the produce of the farm, and also shad and salmon, tea sweetened with molasses, and sweet cakes in contradistinction to the hot cakes not sweetened, the one white, the other yellow, to wind up with. Such, we found, was the prevailing fare, ordinary and extraordinary, along this river. 
Mountain cranberries, Vaccinium vitus idea, stewed and sweetened were the common dessert. Everything here was in profusion and the best of its kind. Butter was in such plenty that it was commonly used before it was salted to grease boots with. In the night, we were entertained by the sound of raindrops on the cedar splints, which covered the roof and awakened the next morning with a drop or two in our eyes. It had set in for a storm, and we made up our minds not to forsake such comfortable quarters with this prospect, but wait for Indians in fair weather. It rained and drizzled and gleamed by turns the live long day. What we did there, how we killed the time, would perhaps be idle to tell. How many times we buttered our boots, and how often a drowsy one was seen to sidle off to the bedroom. When it held up, I strolled up and down the bank and gathered the harebell and cedar berries which grew there. Or else we tried by turns the long-handled axe on the logs before the door. The axe helves here were made to chop standing on the log, a primitive log, of course, and were, therefore, nearly a foot longer than with us. One while we walked over the farm and visited his well-filled barns with McCoslin. There were another of man and two women only here. He kept horses, cows, oxen, and sheep. I think he said that he was the first to bring a plow and a cow so far, and he might have added the last with only two exceptions. The potato rot had found him out here, too, the previous year, and got half or two-thirds of his crop, though the seed was of his own raising. Oats, grass, and potatoes were his staples, but he raised also a few carrots and turnips and a little corn for the hens, for this was all that he dared risk, for fear that it would not ripen. Melons, squashes... Sweet corn, beans, tomatoes, and many other vegetables could not be ripened there. The very few settlers along this stream were obviously tempted by the cheapness of the land mainly. When I asked McCoslin why more settlers did not come in, he answered that one reason was they could not buy the land. It belonged to individuals or companies who were afraid that their wild lands would be settled and so incorporated into towns, and they be taxed for them. But to settling on the state's land, there was no such hindrance. For his own part, he wanted no neighbors. He didn't wish to see any road by his house. Neighbors, even the best, were a trouble and expense, especially on the score of cattle and fences, they might live across the river, perhaps, but not on the same side. The chickens here were protected by the dogs. As McCoslin said, the old one took it up first, and she taught the pup, and now they had got it into their heads that it wouldn't do to have anything of the bird kind on the premises. A hawk hovering over was not allowed to alight, but barked off by the dog circling underneath, and a pigeon, or a yellow hammer, as they called the pigeon woodpecker, on a dead limb or stump was instantly expelled. It was the main business of their day, and kept them constantly coming and going. One would rush out of the house on the last, the least alarm given by the other. When it rained hardest, we returned to the house and took down a tract from the shelf. There was the Wandering Jew, cheap edition and fine print, the criminal calendar, and Parrish's geography, and flash novels two or three. Under the pressure of circumstances, we read a little in these. With such aid, the press is not so feeble an engine, after all. This house, which was a fair specimen of those on this river, was built of huge logs which peeped out everywhere and were chinked with clay and moss. It contained four or five rooms. 
There was no sod boards or shingles or clapboards about it, and scarcely any tool but the axe had been used in its construction. The partitions were made of long clapboard-like splints of spruce or cedar, turned to a delicate salmon color by the smoke. The roof and sides were covered with the same, instead of shingles and clapboards, and some of a much thicker and larger size were used for the floor. These were all so straight and smooth that they answered the purpose admirably, and a careless observer would not have suspected that they were not sawed and planed. The chimney and hearth were of vast size and made of stone. The broom was a few twigs of arbor vita tied to a stick, and a pole was suspended over the hearth, close to the ceiling, to dry stockings and clothes on. I noticed that the floor was full of small dingy holes, as if made with a gimlet, but which were in fact made by the spikes nearly an inch long, which the lumberers wear in their boots to prevent their slipping on wet logs. Just above McCausland's, there is a rocky rapid where logs jam in the spring and many drivers are there collected who frequent his house for supplies. These were their tracks which I saw. At sundown, McCausland pointed away over the forest across the river to signs of fair weather amid the clouds, some evening redness there, for even there, the points of the compass held, and there was a quarter of the heavens appropriated to sunrise and another to sunset. The next morning, the weather proving fair enough for our purpose, we prepared to start, and, the Indians having failed us, persuaded McCausland, who was not unwilling to revisit the scenes of his driving, to accompany us in their stead, intending to engage one other boatman on the way. A strip of cotton cloth for a tent, a couple of blankets, which would suffice for the whole party, fifteen pounds of hard bread, ten pounds of clear pork, and a little tea made up Uncle George's pack. The last three articles were calculated to be provision enough for six men for a week with what we might pick up. A tea kettle, a frying pan, and an axe to be obtained at the last house would complete our outfit. We were soon out of McCausland's clearing and in the evergreen woods again. The obscure trail made by the two settlers above, which even the woodman is sometimes puzzled to discern, ere long crossed a narrow open strip in the woods overrun with weeds, called the Burnt Land, where a fire had raged formerly, stretching northward nine or ten miles to Millinocket Lake. At the end of three miles, we reached Shad Pond, or Nolisimic, an expansion of the river. Hodge, the assistant state geologist who passed through this on the 25th of June, 1837, says... We pushed our boat through an acre or more of buck beans, which had taken root at the bottom and bloomed above the surface in the greatest profusion and beauty. Thomas Fowler's house is four miles from McCausland's on the shore of the pond at the mouth of the Millinocket River and eight miles from the lake of the same name on the latter stream. This lake affords a more direct course to Katahdin, but we preferred to follow the Penobscot and the pa Pamadumke Cook lakes. Fowler was just completing a new log hut and was sawing out a window through the logs, nearly two feet thick when we arrived. He had begun to paper his house with spruce bark turned inside out, which had a good effect and was in keeping with the circumstances. Instead of water, we got here a draught of beer, which it was allowed would be better, clear and thin, but strong and stringent as the cedar sap. 
It was as if we sucked at the very teats of nature's pine-clad bosom in these parts. The sap of all Millinocket botany commingled, the topmost, most fantastic, and spiciest sprays of the primitive wood, and whatever invigorating and stringent gum or essence it afforded steeped and dissolved in it. A lumberer's drink, which would acclimate and naturalize a man at once, which would make him see green, and if he slept, dream that he heard the wind soft among the pines. Here was a fife, praying to be played on, through which we breathed a few tuneful strains, brought hither to tame wild beasts. As we stood upon the pile of chips by the door, fish hawks were sailing overhead, and here, over Shad Pond, might daily be witnessed the tyranny of the bald eagle over that bird. Tom pointed away over the lake to a bald eagle's nest, which was plainly more visible than a mile off, on a pine high above the surrounding forest and was frequented from year to year by the same pair, and held sacred by him. There were these two houses only there, his low hut and the eagle's airy cartload of faggots. Thomas Fowler, too, was persuaded to join us, for two men were necessary to manage the bateau, which was soon to be our carriage, and these men needed to be cool and skillful for the navigation of the Penobscot. Tom's pack was soon made, for he had not far to look for his waterman's boots and a red flannel shirt. This is the favorite color with lumbermen, and red flannel is reputed to possess some mysterious virtues to be most healthful and convenient in respect to perspiration. In every gang there will be a large proportion of red birds. We took here a poor and leaky bateau and began to pull up the Millinocket two miles to the elder fowlers in order to avoid the Grand Falls of the Penobscot intending to exchange our bateau there for a better. The Millinocket is a small, shallow, and sandy stream, full of what I took to be lamprey eels or suckers' nests, and lined with musquash cabins, but free from rapids, according to Fowler, excepting at its outlet from the lake. He was at this time engaged in cutting the native grass rush grass and meadow clover, as he called it, on the meadows and small low islands of this stream. We noticed flattened places in the grass on either side, where he said a moose had laid down the night before, adding that there were thousands in these meadows. Old fowlers on the Millinocket, six miles from McCausland's, and twenty-four from the point is the last house. Gibson's on the Sawadnehunk is the only clearing above, but that had proved a failure and was long since deserted. Fowler is the oldest inhabitant of these woods. He formerly lived a few miles from here on the south side of the West Branch, where he built his house sixteen years ago the first house built above the five islands. Here, our new bateau was to be carried over the first portage of two miles, round the Grand Falls of the Penobscot, on a horse sled made of saplings, to jump the numerous rocks in the way. But we had to wait a couple of hours for them to catch the horses, which were pastured at a distance amid the stumps, and had wandered still farther off. The last of the salmon for this season had just been caught and were still fresh in pickle, from which enough was extracted to fill our empty kettle and so graduate our introduction to simpler forest fare. The week before they had lost nine sheep here out of their first flock by the wolves. The surviving sheep came round the house and seemed frightened. 
which induced them to go and look for the rest, when they found seven dead and lacerated, and two still alive. These last they carried to the house, and, as Mrs. Fowler said, they were merely scratched in the throat and had no more visible wound than would be produced by the prick of a pin. She sheared off the wool from their throats and washed them and put on some salve and turned them out, but in a few moments they were missing and had not been found since. In fact, they were all poisoned, and those that were found swelled up at once, so that they saved neither skin nor wool. This realized the old fables of the wolves and the sheep, and convinced me that that ancient hostility still existed. Verily, the shepherd boy did not need to sound a false alarm this time. There were steel traps by the door of various sizes for wolves, otters, and bears, with large claws instead of teeth to catch in their sinews. Wolves are frequently killed with poisoned bait. At length, after we had dined here on the usual backwoods fair, the horses arrived and we hauled our bateau out of the water and lashed it to its wicker carriage and throwing in our packs, walked on before leaving the boatman and driver, who was Tom's brother, to manage the concern. The route which led through the wild pasture where the sheep were killed was in some places the roughest ever traveled by horses over rocky hills where the sled bounced and slid along like a vessel pitching in a storm, and one man was as necessary to stand at the stern to prevent the boat from being wrecked as a helmsman in the roughest sea. The philosophy of our progress was something like this. When the runners struck a rock three or four feet high, the sled bounced back and upwards at the same time, but as the horses never ceased pulling, it came down on the top of the rock and so we got over it. This portage probably followed the trails of an ancient Indian carry round these falls. By two o'clock, we, who had walked on before, reached the river above the falls not far from the outlet of the Quakish Lake, and waited for the bateau to come up. We had been here but a short time when a thunder shower was seen coming up from the west over the still invisible lakes and that pleasant wilderness which we were so eager to become acquainted with, and soon the heavy drops began to patter on the leaves around us. I had just selected the prostrate trunk of a huge pine, five or six feet in diameter, and was crawling under it, when, luckily, the boat arrived. It would have amused a sheltered man to witness the manner in which it was unlashed and whirled over while the first water spout burst upon us. It was no sooner in the hands of the eager company than it was abandoned, to the first revolutionary impulse and to gravity to adjust it. And they might have been seen all stooping to its shelter and wriggling under like so many eels before it was fairly deposited on the ground. When all were under, we propped up the lee side and busied ourselves where their whittling thole pins for rowing when we should reach the lakes and made the woods ring between the claps of thunder with such boat songs as we could remember. The horses stood sleek and shining with the rain all drooping and crestfallen while deluge after deluge washed over us. But the bottom of a boat may be relied on for a tight roof. At length, after two hours' delay at this place, a streak of fair weather appeared in the northwest, whither our course now lay, promising a serene evening for our voyage, and the driver returned with his horses while we made haste to launch our boat and commence our voyage in good earnest. 
There were six of us, including the two boatmen, with our packs heaped up near the bows and ourselves disposed as baggage to trim the boat, with instructions not to move in case we should strike a rock. More than so many barrels of pork, we pushed out into the first rapid, a slight specimen of the stream we had to navigate. With Uncle George in the stern and Tom in the bows, each using a spruce pole about 12 feet long, pointed with iron, and poling on the same side, we shot up the rapids like a salmon, the water rushing and roaring around, so that only a practiced eye could distinguish a safe course or tell what was deep water and what rocks frequently grazing the latter on one or both sides with a hundred as narrow escapes as ever the Argo had in passing through the Simplegades. I, who had had some experience in boating, had never experienced any half so exhilarating before. We were lucky to have exchanged our Indians, whom we did not know, for these men, who, together with Tom's brother, were reputed the best boatmen on the river and were at once indispensable pilots and pleasant companions. The canoe is smaller, more easily upset, and sooner worn out, and the Indian is said not to be so skillful in the management of the bateau. He is, for the most part, less to be relied on and more disposed to sulks and whims. The utmost familiarity with dead streams or with the ocean would not prepare a man for this peculiar navigation, and the most skillful boatman anywhere else would here be obliged to take out his boat and carry round a hundred times, still with great risk as well as delay, where the practiced bateau man pulls up with comparative ease and safety. The hardy voyager pushes with incredible perseverance and success quite up to the foot of the falls, and then only carries round some perpendicular ledge and launches it again in. To struggle with the boiling rapids above. The Indians say that the river once ran both ways, one up, half up, and the other down, but that, since the white man came, it all runs down, and now they must laboriously pull their canoes against the stream and carry them over numerous portages. In the summer, all stores, the grindstone and the plow of the pioneer, flour, pork, and utensils for the explorer, must be conveyed up the river in bateau, and many a cargo and many a boatman is lost on these waters. In the winter, however, which is very equable and long, the ice is the great highway and the loggers' team penetrates to Chizuncook Lake and still higher up, even 200 miles above Bangor. Imagine the solitary sled track running far up into the snowy and evergreen wilderness hemmed in closely for a hundred miles by the forest and again stretching straight across the broad surfaces of concealed lakes. We were soon in the smooth water of the Quakish Lake and took our turns at rowing and paddling across it. It is a small, irregular, but handsome lake shut in on all sides by the forest and showing no traces of man but some low boom in a distant cove reserved for spring use. The spruce and cedar on its shores, hung with gray lichens, looked at a distance like the ghosts of trees. Ducks were sailing here and there on its surface, and a solitary loon, like a more living wave, a vital spot on the lake's surface, laughed and frolicked and showed its straight leg for our amusement. Joe Mary Mountain appeared in the northwest as if it, it were looking down on this lake especially, and we had our first but a partial view of Katahdin, its summit veiled in clouds like a dark isthmus 
in that qu quarter, connecting the heavens with the earth. After two miles of smooth rowing across this lake, we found ourselves in the river again, which was a continuous rapid for one mile to the dam, requiring all the strength and skill of our boatmen to pull up it. This dam is a quite important and expensive work for this country, whither cattle and horses cannot penetrate in the summer, raising the whole river ten feet and flooding, as they said, some sixty square miles by means of innumerable lakes with which the river connects. It is a lofty and solid structure with sloping piers some distance above, made of frames of logs filled with stones to break the ice. Here, every log pays toll as it passes through the sluices. We filed into the rude loggers camp at this place, such as I have described without ceremony, and the cook at that moment, the sole occupant, at once set about preparing tea for his visitors. His fireplace, which the rain had converted into a mud puddle, was soon blazing again, and we sat down on the log benches around it to dry us. On the well-flattened and somewhat faded beds of arbor vita leaves, which stretched on either hand under the eaves behind us, lay an odd leaf of the Bible, some gene genealogical chapter out of the Old Testament, and half buried by the leaves, we found Emerson's address on West India Emancipation, which had been left here formerly by one of our company and had made two converts to the Liberty Party here, as I was told. Also, an odd number of the Westminster Review for 1834 and a pamphlet entitled History of the Erection of the Monument on the Grave of Myron Holly. This was the readable or reading matter in a lumberer's camp in the main woods, 30 miles from a road, which would be given up to the bears in a fortnight. These things were well thumbed and soiled. This gang was headed by one John Morrison, a good specimen of a Yankee, and was necessarily composed of men not bred to the business of dam building, but who were jacks at all trades, handy with the axe, and other simple implements, and well skilled in wood and watercraft. We had hot cakes for our supper even here, white as snowballs, but without butter, and the never failing sweet cakes with which we filled our pockets, foreseeing that we should not soon meet with the like again. Such delicate puffballs seemed a singular diet for backwoodsmen. There was also tea without milk, sweetened with molasses. And so, exchanging a word with John Morrison and his gang when we had returned to the shore, and also exchanging our bateau for a better still, we made haste to improve the little daylight that remained. This camp, exactly 29 miles from Matawamkeg Point, by the way we had come, and about 100 from Bangor by the river, was the last human habitation of any kind in this direction. Beyond, there was no trail, and the river and lakes, by bateau and canoes, was considered the only practical route. We were about 30 miles by the river from the summit of Katahdin, which was in sight, though not more than 20 perhaps in a straight line. It being about the full of the moon and a warm and pleasant evening, we decided to row five miles by moonlight to the head of the North Twin Lake, lest the wind should rise on the morrow. After one mile of river, or what the boatmen called thoroughfare, for the river becomes at length only the connecting link between the lakes and some slight rapid which had been mostly made smooth water by the dam, we entered the North Twin Lake 
just after sundown and stared across for the river thoroughfare four miles distant. This is a noble sheet of water where one may get the impression which a new country and a lake of the woods are fitted to create. There was the smoke of no log hut nor camp of any kind to greet us. Still less was any lover of nature or musing traveler watching our bateau from the distant hills. Not even the Indian hunter was there, for he rarely climbs them, but hugs the river like ourselves. No face welcomed us, but the fine fantastic sprays of free and happy evergreen trees waving one above another in their ancient home. At first the red clouds hung over the western shore as gorgeously as if over a city, and the lake lay open to the light with even a civilized aspect as if expecting trade and commerce and towns and villas. We could distinguish the inlet to the south twin, which is said to be the larger, where the shore was misty blue, and it was worth the while to look thus through a narrow opening across the entire expanse of a concealed lake to its own yet more dim and distant shore. The shores rose gently to ranges of low hills covered with forests, and though, in fact, the most valuable white pine timber, even about this lake, had been called out, this would never have been suspected by the voyager. The impression, which indeed corresponded with the fact, was as if we were upon a high tableland between the States and Canada, the northern side of which is drained by the St. John and Chaudière, the southern by the Penobscot and Kennebec. There was no bold mountainous shore, as we might have expected, but only isolated hills and mountains raised, rising here and there from the plateau. The country is an archipelago of lakes, the lake country of New England. Their levels vary but a few feet, and the boatmen, by short portages, or by none at all, pass easily from one to another. They say that at very high water the Penobscot and the Kennebec flow into each other, or at any rate, that you may lie with your face in the one and your toes in the other. Even the Penobscot and St. John have been connected by a canal, so that the lumber of the Allagash, instead of going down the St. John, comes down the Penobscot, and the Indian's tradition that the Penobscot once ran both ways for his convenience is in one sense partially realized today. None of our party but McCausland had been above this lake, so we trusted to him to pilot us and we could not but confess the importance of a pilot on these waters. While it is a river, you will not easily forget which way is upstream, but when you enter a lake, the river is completely lost, and you scan the distant shores in vain to find where it comes in. A stranger is, for the time at least, lost, and must set about a voyage of discovery first of all to find the river to follow the windings of the shore when the lake is ten miles or even more in length, and of an irregularity which will not soon be mapped is a wearisome voyage and will spend his time and his provisions. They tell a story of a gang of experienced woodmen sent to a location in, on this stream who were thus lost in the wilderness of lakes. They cut their way through thickets and carried their baggage and their boats over from lake to lake, sometimes several miles. They carried into Millinocket Lake, which is on another stream and is ten miles square and contains a hundred islands. They explored its shores thoroughly and then carried into another and another, and it was a week of toil and anxiety before they found the Penobscot River again, and then their provisions were exhausted and they were obliged to return. 
While Uncle George steered for a small island near the head of the lake, now just visible like a speck on the water, we rowed by turns swiftly over its surface, singing such boat songs as we could remember. The shore seemed at an indefinite distance in the moonlight. Occasionally we paused in our singing and rested on our oars, while we listened to hear if the wolves howled for this is a common serenade, and my companions affirmed that it was the most dismal and unearthly of sounds. But we heard none this time. If we did not hear, however, we did listen, not without a reasonable expectation, that at least I have to tell. Only some utterly uncivilized, big-throated owl hooted loud and dismally in the drear and bowy wilderness, plainly not nervous about his solitary life, nor afraid to hear the echoes of his voice there. We remembered also that possibly moose were silently watching us from the distant coves, or some surly bear or timid caribou had been startled by our singing. It was with new emphasis that we sang there the Canadian boat song. <clears throat> Row, brothers, row, the streams run fast, the rapids are near, and the daylight's past. Which describes precisely our own adventure, and was inspired by the experience of a similar kind of life. For the rapids were ever near, and the daylight long past. The woods on shore looked dim, and many an Udawas tied here emptied into the lake. Why should we yet our sail unfurl? There is not a breath the blue wave to curl. But when the wind blows off the shore, Oh, sweetly we'll rest our weary oar. Udawa's tide, this trembling moon, Shall see us float over thy surges soon. At last we glided past the green isle, Which had been our landmark, all joining in the chorus, as if by the watery links of rivers and of lakes, we were about to float over unmeasured zones of earth, bound on unimaginable adventures. Saint of this green isle, hear our prayers, O oh, grant us cool heavens and favoring airs. About nine o'clock we reached the river, and ran our boat into a natural haven between some rocks, and drew her out on the sand. This camping ground McCausland had been familiar with in his lumbering days, and he now struck it unerringly in the moonlight, and we heard the sound of the rill which would supply us with cool water emptying into the lake. The first business was to make a fire, an operation which was a little delayed by the wetness of the fuel and the ground, owing to the heavy showers of the afternoon. The fire is the main comfort of the camp, whether in summer or winter, and is about as ample at one season as at another. <clears throat> it is as well for cheerfulness as for warmth and dryness. It forms one side of the camp, one bright side at any rate. Some were dispersed to fetch in dead trees and boughs, while Uncle George felled the birches and beeches, which stood convenient, and soon we had a fire some ten feet long by three or four high, which rapidly dried the sand before it. This was calculated to burn all night. We next proceeded to pitch our tent, which operation was performed by sticking our two spike poles into the ground in a slanting direction about ten feet apart for rafters and then drawing our cotton cloth over them and tying it down at the ends, leaving it open in front shed fashion. But this evening the wind carried the sparks on to the tent and burned it. So we hastily drew up the bateau just within the edge of the woods before the fire 
and propped up one side three or four feet high, spread the tent on the ground to lie on, and with the corner of a blanket, or what more or less we could get to put over us, lay down with our heads and bodies under the boat and our feet and legs on the sand toward the fire. At first we lay awake, talking of our course and finding ourselves in so convenient a posture for studying the heavens with the moon and stars shining in our faces. Our conversation naturally turned upon astronomy, and we recounted by turns the most interesting discoveries in that science. But at length we composed ourselves seriously to sleep. It was interesting, when awakened at midnight, to watch the grotesque and fiend-like forms and motions of some one of the party who, not being able to sleep, had got up silently to arouse the fire and add fresh fuel for a change, now stealthily lugging a dead tree from out of the dark and heaving it on, now stirring up the embers with his fork, or tiptoeing about to observe the stars, watched perchance by half the prostrate party in breathless silence. So much the more intense because they were awake while each supposed his neighbor sound asleep. Thus aroused, I, too, brought fresh fuel to the fire and then rambled along the sandy shore in the moonlight, hoping to meet a moose come down to drink or else a wolf. The little rill tinkled the louder and peopled all the wilderness for me, and the glassy smoothness of the sleeping lake, laving the shores of a new world with the dark, fantastic rocks rising here and there from its surface, made a scene not easily described. It has left such an impression of stern yet gentle wildness on my memory as will not soon be effaced. Not far from midnight, we were one after another awakened by rain falling on our extremities, and as each was made aware of the fact by cold or wet. He drew a long sigh and then drew up his legs until gradually we had all sidled round from lying at right angles with the boat till our bodies formed an acute angle with it and were wholly protected. When we next awoke, the moon and stars were shining again and there were signs of dawn in the east I have been thus particular in order to convey some idea of a night in the woods. We had soon launched and loaded our boat, and leaving our fire blazing, were off again before breakfast. The lumberers rarely trouble themselves to put out their fires, such is the dampness of the primitive forest, and this is one cause, no doubt, of the frequent fires in Maine, of which we hear so much on smoky days in Massachusetts. The forests are held cheap after the white pine has been called out, and the explorers and hunters pray for rain only to clear the atmosphere of smoke. The woods were so wet today, however, that there was no danger of our sp fire spreading. After pulling up half a mile of river or thoroughfare, we rode a mile across the foot of Pamadumcook Lake, which is the name given on the map to this whole chain of lakes as if there was but one, though they are in each instance distinctly separated by a reach of the river with its narrow and rocky channel and its rapids. This lake, which is one of the largest, stretched northwest ten miles to hills and mountains in the distance. McCausland pointed to some distant and as yet inaccessible forests of white pine on the sides of a mountain in that direction, the Joe Mary Lakes, which lay between us and Moosehead on the west, were recently, if they are not still, surrounded by some of the best timbered land in the state. 
By another thoroughfare we passed into Deep Cove, a part of the same lake which makes up two miles toward the northeast, and rowing two miles across this, by another short thoroughfare entered Ambijiji's Lake. At, at the entrance to a lake we sometimes observed what is technically called fencing stuff, or the unhewn timbers of which booms are formed, either secured together in the water or laid up on the rocks and lashed to trees for spring use. But it was always startling to discover so plain a trail of civilized man there. I remember that I was strangely affected when we were returning by the sight of a ring bolt well drilled into a rock and fastened with lead at the head of this solitary ambiguous lake. It was easy to see that driving logs must be an exciting as well as arduous and dangerous business. All winter long, the logger goes on piling up the trees, which he has trimmed and hauled in some dry ravine at the head of a stream, and then in the spring he stands on the bank and whistles for rain and thaw, ready to wring the perspiration out of his shirt to swell the tide, till suddenly, with a whoop and halloo from him, shutting his eyes as if to bid farewell, to the existing state of things, a fair proportion of his winter's work goes scrambling down the country, followed by his faithful dogs, thaw and rain and freshet and rain wind, and whole pack in full cry toward the Orono mills. Every log is marked with the owner's name, cut in the sapwood with an axe or bored with an auger, so deep as not to be worn off in the driving, and yet not so as to injure the timber, and it requires considerable ingenuity to invent new and simple marks where there are so many owners. They have quite an alphabet of their own, which only the practiced can read. One of my companions read off from his own memorandum book some marks of his logs, among which there were crosses, belts, crow's feet, girdles, etc., as Y girdle, crowfoot, and various other devices. When the logs have run the gauntlet of innumerable rapids and falls, each on its own account, with more or less jamming and bruising, those bearing various owner's marks being mixed up together, since all must take advantage of the same freshet. They are collected together at the heads of the lakes and surrounded by a boom fence of floating logs to prevent their being dispersed by the wind and are thus towed all together, like a flock of sheep across the lake, where there is no current by a windlass or boom head such as we sometimes saw standing on an island or headland, and if circumstances permit, with the aid of sails and oars. Sometimes, notwithstanding, the logs are dispersed over many miles of lake surface in a few hours by winds and freshets and thrown up on distant shores, where the driver can pick up only one or two at a time, and return with them to the thoroughfare. And before he gets his flock well through Ambijigis or Pamadumcook, he makes many a wet and an uncomfortable camp on the shore. He must be able to navigate a log as if it were a canoe, and be as indifferent to cold and wet as a muskrat. He uses a few efficient tools a lever commonly of rock maple, six or seven feet long with a stout spike in it, strongly ferruled on, and a long spike pole with a screw at the end of the spike to make it hold. The boys along shore learn to walk on floating logs as city boys on sidewalks. 
Sometimes the logs are thrown up on rocks in such positions as to be irrecoverable, but by another freshet as high, or they jam together at rapids and falls and accumulate in vast piles, which the driver must start at the risk of his life. Such is the lumber business, which depends on many accidents, as the early freezing of the rivers, that the teams may get up in season a sufficient freshet in the spring to fetch the logs down and many others. I quote Michaud on lumbering on the Kennebec, then the source of the best white pine lumber carried to England. Quote, the persons engaged in this branch of industry are generally emigrants from New Hampshire. In the summer, they unite in small companies and traverse these vast solitudes in every direction to ascertain the places in which the pines abound. After cutting the grass and converting it into hay for the nourishment of the cattle to be employed in their labor, they return home. In the beginning of the winter, they enter the forest again, establish themselves in huts covered with the bark of the canoe birch or the arbor vita. And though the cold is so intense that the mercury sometimes remains for several weeks from 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit below the point of con congelation, they persevere with unabated courage in their work. Unquote. According to Springer, the company consists of choppers, swampers who make roads, barker and loader, teamster and cook. Quote, when the trees are felled, they cut them into logs from 14 to 18 feet long, and by means of their cattle, which they employ with great dexterity, drag them to the river, and after stamping on them a mark of property, roll them on its frozen bosom. At the breaking of the ice in the spring, they float down with the current. The logs that are not drawn the first year, unquote, adds Misho, are attacked by large worms which form holes but two lines in diameter in every direction, but if stripped of their bark, they will remain uninjured for 30 years, unquote. Ambiguous this quiet Sunday morning struck me as the most beautiful lake we had seen. It is said to be one of the deepest. We had the fairest view of Joe Mary, Double Top, and Katahdin from its surface. The summit of the latter had a singularly flat tableland appearance, like a short highway where a demigod might be let down to take a turn or two in an afternoon to settle his dinner. We rode a mile and a half to the near the head of the lake and pushing through a field of lily pads landed to cook our breakfast by the side of a r large rock known to McCausland. Our breakfast consisted of tea with hard bread and pork and fried salmon which we ate with forks neatly whittled from alder twigs, which grew there off strips of birch bark for plates. The tea was black tea without milk to color or sugar to sweeten it, and two tin dippers were our teacups. This beverage is as indispensable to the loggers as to any gossiping old woman in the land, and they, no doubt, derive great comfort from it. Here was the site of an old logger's camp, remembered by McCoslin, now overgrown with weeds and bushes. In the midst of a dense underwood, we noticed a whole brick on a rock in a small run, clean and red and square as in a brickyard which had been brought thus far formally for tamping. Some of us afterward regretted that we had not carried this on with us to the top of the mountain to be left there for our mark. 
It would certainly have been a simple evidence of civilized man. McCausland said that large wooden crosses made of oak still sound were sometimes found standing in this wilderness, which were set up by the first Catholic missionaries who came through to the Kennebec. In the next nine miles, which were the extent of our voyage, and which it took us the rest of the day to get over, we rode across several small lakes, pulled up numerous rapids and thoroughfares, and carried over four portages. I will give the names and distances for the benefit of future tourists. <clears throat> First, after leaving Ambujijis Lake, we had a quarter of a mile of rapids to the portage or carry of 90 rods around Ambujijis Falls. Then a mile and a half through Passamagamet Lake, which is narrow and river-like, to the falls of the same name, Ambidigious Stream coming in on the right, then two miles through Katepskonegin Lake to the portage of 90 rods around Katepskonegin Falls, which name signifies carrying place. Passamagamet Stream coming in on the left, then three miles through Pakwakmas Lake, a slight expansion of the river to the portage of 40 rods around the falls of the same name. Katepskanigan Stream coming in on the left, then three quarters of a mile through Abuljakarmigas Lake, similar to the last to the portage of 40 rods around the falls of the same name, then half a mile of rapid water to the Sawidnahunk Deadwater and the Abuljaknagisik Stream. This is generally the order of names as you ascend the river. First, the lake, or if there is no expansion, the dead water, then the falls, then the stream emptying into the lake or river above, all of the same name. First we came to Passamagamet Lake, then to Passamagamet Falls, then to Passamagamet Stream, emptying in. This order and identity of names, it will be perceived as quite philosophical, since the dead water or lake is always at least partially produced by the stream emptying in above and the first fall below, which is the outlet of that lake and where that tributary water makes its first plunge also naturally bears the name. At the portage around Ambidigious Falls, I observed a pork barrel on the shore with a hole eight or nine inches square cut in one side, which was set against an upright rock. But the bears, without turning or upsetting the barrel, had gnawed a hole in the opposite side, which looked exactly like an enormous rat hole, big enough to put their heads in, and at the bottom of the barrel was still left a few mangled and slabbered slices of pork. It is usual for the lumberers to leave such supplies as they cannot conveniently carry along with them at carries or camps to which the next comers do not scruple to help themselves, they being the property commonly not of an individual but a company who can afford to deal liberally. I will describe particularly how we get got over some of these portages and rapids in order that the reader may get an idea of the boatman's life. At Ambidigis Falls, for instance, there was the roughest path imaginable, cut through the woods, at first uphill, at an angle of nearly 45 degrees over rocks and logs without end, this was the manner of the portage. We first carried over our baggage and deposited it on the shore at the other end, then, returning to the bateau, 
We dragged it up the hill by the painter and onward, with frequent pauses over half the portage. But this was a bungling way, and would soon have worn out the boat. Commonly, three men walk over with a bateau weighing from three to five or six hundred pounds on their heads and shoulders, the tallest standing under the middle of the boat, which is turned over, and one at each end, or else there are two at the bows. More cannot well take hold at once, but this requires some practice as well as strength, and is in any case extremely laborious and wearing to the constitution to follow. We were, on the whole, rather an, an invalid party, and could render our boatmen but little assistance. Our two men at length took the bateau upon their shoulders, and while two of us steadied it to prevent it from rocking and wearing into their shoulders, on which they placed their hats folded, walked bravely over the remaining distance with two or three pauses. In the same manner they accomplished the other portages, with this crushing weight, they must climb and stumble along over fallen trees and slippery rocks of all sizes, where those who walked by the sides were continually brushed off, such was the narrowness of the path. But we were fortunate not to have cut our path in the first place. Before we launched our boat, we scraped the bottom smooth again, with our knives where it had rubbed on the rocks to save friction. To avoid the difficulties of the portage, our men determined to warp up the Passamagamet Falls. So while the rest walked over the portage with the baggage, I remained in the bateau to assist in warping up. We were soon in the midst of the rapids, which were more swift and tumultuous than any we had pulled up, and had turned to the side of the stream for the purpose of warping, when the boatmen, who felt some pride in their skill and were ambitious to do something more than usual, for my benefit, as I surmised, took one more view of the rapids, or rather the falls, and in answer to our question, whether we couldn't get up there, the other answered that he guessed he'd tried. So we pushed again into the midst of the stream and began to struggle with the current. I sat in the middle of the boat to trim it, moving slightly to the right or left as it grazed a rock. With an uncertain and wavering motion, we wound and bolted our way up until the bow was actually raised two feet above the stern at the steepest pitch, and then, when everything depended upon his exertions, the bowman's pole snapped in two. But before he had time to take the spare one, which I reached him, he had saved himself with the fragment upon a rock. And so we got up by a hair's breadth, and Uncle George exclaimed that that was never done before, and he had not tried it, if he had not known whom he had got in the bow, nor he in the bow, if he had not known him in the stern. At this place there was a regular portage cut through the woods, and our boatmen had never known a bateau to ascend the falls. As near as I can remember, there was a perpendicular fall here, at the worst place of the whole Penobscot River two or three feet at least. I could not sufficiently admire the skill and coolness with which they performed this feat, never speaking to each other. The bowman, not looking behind, but knowing exactly what the other is about, works as if he worked alone, now sounding in vain for a bottom in fifteen feet of water, while the boat falls back several rods, held straight only with the greatest skill and exertion, or while the stir man obstinately holds his ground like a turtle 
The bowman springs from side to side with wonderful suppleness and dexterity, scanning the rapids and the rocks with a thousand eyes. And now, having got a bite at last, with a lusty shove, which makes his pole bend and quiver, and the whole boat tremble, he gains a few feet upon the river. To add to the danger, the poles are liable at any time to be caught between the rocks and wrenched out of their hands, leaving them at the mercy of the rapids. The rocks, as it were, lying in wait, like so many alligators, to catch them in their teeth and jerk them from your hands before you have stolen an effectual shove against their pallets. The pole is set close to the boat, and the prow is made to overshoot, and just turn the corners of the rocks in the very teeth of the rapids. Nothing but the length and lightness and the slight draft of the bateau enables them to make any headway. The bowman must quickly choose his course. There is no time to deliberate. Frequently the boat is shoved between rocks where both sides touch and the waters on either hand are a perfect maelstrom. Half a mile above this two of us tried our hands at pulling up a slight rapid and we were just surmounting the last difficulty when an unlucky rock confounded our calculations. And while the bateau was sweeping round irrecoverably amid the whirlpool, we were obliged to resign the poles to more skillful hands. Katupskanegan is one of the shallowest and weediest of the lakes and looked as if it might abound in pickerel. The falls of the same name where we stop to dine are considerable and quite picturesque. Here, Uncle George had seen trout caught by the barrelful, but they would not rise to our bait at this hour. Halfway over this carry, thus far in the main wilderness on its way to the provinces, we noticed a large flaming oak hall handbill about two feet long, wrapped around the trunk of a pine from which the bark had been stripped and to which it was fast glued by the pitch. This should be recorded among the advantages of this mode of advertising that so possibly even the bears and wolves, moose, deer, otter, and beaver, not to mention the Indian, may learn where they can fit themselves according to the latest fashion or at least recover some of their own lost garments. We christened this the Oak Hall Carry. The forenoon was as serene and placid on this wild stream in the woods as we were apt to imagine that Sunday in summer, usually in Massachusetts. We were occasionally startled by the screams of a bald eagle sailing over the stream in front of our bateau, or of the fish hawks on whom he levies his contributions. There were, at intervals, small meadows of a few acres on the sides of the stream, waving with uncut grass, which attracted the attention of our boatmen, who regretted that they were not nearer to their clearings, and calculated how many stacks they might cut. Two or three men sometimes spend the summer by themselves, cutting the grass in these meadows to sell to the loggers in the winter, since it will fetch a higher price on the spot than in any market in the state. On a small isle covered with this kind of rush or cut grass, on which we landed to consult about our further course, we noticed the recent track of a moose, a large, roundish hole in the soft, wet ground, evincing the great size and weight of the animal that made it. They are fond of the water and visit all these island meadows, swimming as easily from island to island as they make their way through the thickets on land. 
Now and then we passed what McCausland called a pokey Logan, an Indian term for what the drivers might have reason to call a poke logs in, an inlet that leads nowhere. If you get in, you have got to get out again the same way. These and the frequent runarounds which come into the river again would embarrass an inexperienced voyager not a little. The carry round Pokwakamas Falls was exceedingly rough and rocky, the bateau having to be lifted directly from the water up four or five feet onto a rock and launched again down a similar bank. The rocks on this portage were covered with the dents made by the spikes in the lumberer's boots while staggering over under the weight of their bateau, and you could see where the surface of some large rocks on which they had rested their bateau was worn quite smooth with use. As it was, we had carried over but half the usual portage at this place for this stage of the water and launched our boat in the smooth wave, just curving to the fall, prepared to struggle with the most violent rapid we had to encounter. The rest of the party walked over the remainder of the portage while I remained with the boatman to assist in warping up. One had to hold the boat while the others got in to prevent it from going over the falls. When we had pushed up the rapids as far as possible, keeping close to the shore, Tom seized the painter and leaped out upon a rock just visible in the water, but he lost his footing, notwithstanding his spiked boots, and was instantly amid the rapids, but recovering himself by good luck and reaching another rock, he passed the painter to me, who had followed him and took his place again in the bows. Leaping from rock to rock in the shoal water close to the shore and now and then getting a bite with rope around an upright one, I held the boat while one reset his pole, and then all three forced it upward against any rapid. This was warping up. When a part of us walked around at such a place, we generally took the precaution to take out the most valuable part of the baggage for fear of being swamped. As we pulled up a swift rapid for half a mile above Abulja Carmigas Falls, some of the party read their own marks on the huge logs which lay piled up high and dry on the rocks on either hand, the relics probably of a jam which had taken place here in the great freshet in the spring. Many of these would have to wait for another great freshet perchance if they lasted so long before they could be got off. It was singular enough to meet with property of theirs which they had never seen and where they had never been before, thus detained by freshets and rocks when on its way to them. Methinks that must be where all my property lies, cast up on the rocks on some distant and unexplored stream and waiting for an unheard of freshet to fetch it down. O oh, make haste, ye gods, with your winds and rains, and start the jam before it rots. The last half mile carried us to the Sawinahunk dead water, so called from the stream of the same name, signifying running between mountains, an important tributary which comes in a mile above. Here we decided to camp about 20 miles from the dam at the mouth of Merch Brook and the Aboljaknegisik mountain streams broad off from Katahdin and about a dozen miles from its summit, having made 15 miles this day. 
We had been told by McCausland that we should here find trout enough. So while some prepared the camp, the rest fell to fishing, seizing the birch poles which some party of Indians or white hunters had left on the shore, and baiting our hooks with pork and with trout as soon as they were caught. We cast our lines into the mouth of the Aboljak Nijisik, a clear, swift, shallow stream which came in from Katahdin. Instantly, a shoal of white shivin, silvery roaches, cousin trout or what not, large and small, prowling thereabouts, fell upon our bait, and one after another were landed amidst the bushes. Anon their cousins, the true trout, took their turn, and alternately the speckled trout and the silvery roaches swallowed the bait as fast as we could throw in, and the finest specimens of both that I have ever seen, the largest one weighing three pounds, were heaved upon the shore, though at first in vain to wriggle down into the water again, for we stood in the boat, but soon we learned to remedy this evil. For one, who had lost his hook, stood on shore to catch them as they fell in a perfect shower around him. Sometimes wet and slippery, full in his face and bosom, as his arms were outstretched to receive them. While yet alive, before their tints had faded, they glistened like the fairest flowers, the product of primitive rivers, and he could hardly trust his senses as he stood over them, that these jewels should have swam away in that abuljak Najisik water for so long, so many dark ages, these bright fluviatile flowers, seen of Indians only, made beautiful, the Lord only knows why to swim there. I could understand better for this the truth of mythology, the fables of Proteus and all those beautiful sea monsters, how all history indeed put to a ter terrestrial use is mere history, but put to a celestial is mythology always. But there is the rough voice of Uncle George, who commands at the frying pan to send over what you've got, and then you may stay till morning. The pork sizzles and cries for fish. Luckily for the foolish race, and this particularly foolish generation of trout, the night shut down at last, not a little deepened by the dark side of Katahdin, which, like a permanent shadow, reared itself from the eastern bank. Lescar Beau, writing in 1609, tells us that the sewer Champdoré, who, with one of the people of the sewer de Mons, ascended some fifty leagues up the St. John in 1608, found the fish so plenty. Kiwan Maton la chatière sur le feu il en avant pris suffisamment pour au dîner avant que le feu chaud. Their descendants here are no less numerous, so we accompanied Tom into the woods to cut cedar twigs for our bed. While he went ahead with the axe and lopped off the smallest twigs of the flat-leaved cedar, the arbor vita of the gardens, we gathered them up and returned with them to the boat until it was loaded. Our bed was made with as much care and skill as a roof is shingled. Beginning at the foot and laying the twig end of the cedar upward, we advanced to the head, a course at a time, thus successively covering the stub ends and producing a soft and level bed. For us, six, it was about ten feet long by six in breadth. This time we lay under our tent, having pitched it more prudently with reference to the wind and the flame, and the usual huge fire blazed in front. Supper was eaten off a large log, 
which some freshet had thrown up. This night we had a dish of arbor vita, or cedar tea, which the lumberer sometimes uses when other herbs fail. A quart of arbor vita to make him strong and mighty. But I had no wish to repeat the experiment. It had too medicinal a taste for my palate. There was the skeleton of a moose here, whose bones some Indian hunters had picked on this very spot. In the night I dreamed of trout fishing, and when at length I awoke, it seemed a fable that this painted fish swam there so near my couch and rose to our hooks the last evening, and I doubted if I had not dreamt it at all. So I arose before dawn to test its truth while my companions were still sleeping. There stood Katahdin with distinct and cloudless outlines in the moonlight, and the rippling of the rapids was the only sound to break the stillness. Standing on the shore, I once more cast my line into the stream and found the dream to be real and the fable true. The speckled trout and silvery roach like flying fish sped swiftly through the moonlight air, describing bright arcs on the dark side of Katahdin, until moonlight, now fading into daylight, brought satiety to my mind and the minds of my companions who had joined me. By six o'clock, having mounted our packs and a good blanket full of trout, ready dressed, and swung up such baggage and provision as we wished to leave behind upon the tops of saplings to be out of the reach of bears, we started for the summit of the mountain, distant, as Uncle George said the boatmen called it, about four miles, but as I judged and, and as it proved, nearer fourteen. He had never been any nearer the mountain than this, and there was not the slightest trace of man to guide us farther in this direction. At first, pushing a few rods up the Abuljaknajisik, or open land stream, we fastened our bateau to a tree and traveled up the north side through burnt lands, now partially overgrown with young aspens and other shrubbery. But soon, recrossing this stream, where it was about fifty or sixty feet wide, upon a jam of logs and rocks, and you could cross it by this means almost anywhere, we struck at once for the highest peak, over a mile or more of comparatively open land, still very gradually ascending the while. Here it fell to my lot, as the oldest mountain climber to take the lead. So, scanning the woody side of the mountain, which lay still at an indefinite distance, stretched out some seven or eight miles in length before us, we determined to steer directly for the base of the highest peak, leaving a large slide by which, as I have since learned, some of our predecessors ascended on our left. This course would lead us parallel to a dark seam in the forest, which marked the bed of a torrent, and over a slight spur which extended southward from the main mountain from whose bare summit we could get an outlook over the country and climb directly up the peak, which would then be close at hand. Seen from this point, a bare ridge at the extremity of the open land, Katahdin presented a different aspect from any mountain I have seen, there being a greater proportion of naked rock rising abruptly from the forest and we looked up this blue barrier as if it were some fragment of a wall which anciently bounded the earth in that direction, setting the compass for a northeast course, which was the bearing of the southern base of the highest peak. We were soon buried in the woods. We soon began to meet with traces of bear and moose, and those of rabbits were everywhere visible. The tracks of moose, more or less recent, to speak literally, covered every square rod on the sides of the mountain, 
And these animals are probably more numerous there now than ever before, being driven into this wilderness from all sides by the settlements. The track of a full-grown moose is like that of a cow or larger, and of the young like that of a calf. Sometimes we found ourselves traveling in faint paths, where they had made like cow paths in the woods, only far more indistinct, being rather openings affording imperfect vistas through the dense underwood than trodden paths. And everywhere the twigs had been browsed by them, clipped as smoothly as if by a knife. The bark of trees was stripped up by them to the height of eight or nine feet in long, narrow strips an inch wide, still showing the distinct marks of their teeth. We expected nothing less to meet a herd of them every moment, and our nimrod held this shooting iron in readiness. But we did not go out of our way to look for them, and though numerous, they are so wary that the unskillful hunter might range the forest a long time before he could get a sight of one. They are sometimes dangerous to encounter and will not turn out for the hunter, but furiously rush upon him and trample him to death unless he is lucky enough to avoid them by dodging around a tree. The largest are nearly as large as a horse and weigh sometimes 1,000 pounds, and it is said that they can step over a five-foot gate in their ordinary walk. They are described as exceedingly awkward-looking animals, with their long legs and short bodies making a ludicrous figure when in full run, but making great headway nevertheless. It seemed a mystery to us how they could thread these woods, which it required all our suppleness to accomplish. Climbing, stooping, and winding alternately, they are said to drop their long and branching horns, which usually spread five or six feet on their backs, and make their way easily by the weight of their bodies. Our boatmen said, but I know not with how much truth, that their horns are apt to be gnashed away by vermin while they sleep. Their flesh, which is more like beef than venison, is common in Bangor Market. We had proceeded on thus seven or eight miles till about noon, with frequent pauses to refresh the weary ones, crossing a considerable mountain stream, which we conjectured to be Merch Brook, at whose mouth we had camped all the time in woods without having once seen the summit and rising very gradually when the boatmen beginning to despair a little and fearing that we were leaving the mountain on one side of us, for they had not entire faith in the compass. McCoslin climbed a tree, from the top of which he could see the peak, when it appeared that he, we had not swerved from a right line, the compass down below still ranging with his arm, which pointed to the summit. By the side of a cool mountain rill, amid the woods where the water began to partake of the purity and transparency of the air, we stopped to cook some of our fishes, which we had brought thus far in order to save our hard bread and pork, in the use of which we had put ourselves on short allowance. We soon had a fire blazing and stood around it, under the damp and somber forest of firs and birches, each with a sharpened stick three or four feet in length, upon which he had spitted his trout or roach, previously well gashed and salted, our sticks radiating like the spokes of a wheel from one center, and each crowding his particular fish into the most desirable exposure not with the truest regard always to his neighbor's rights. Thus we regaled ourselves, drinking meanwhile at the spring, till one man's pack at least was considerably lightened. When we again took up our line of march, 
At length we reached an elevation sufficiently bare to afford a view of the summit, still distant and blue, almost as if retreating from us. A torrent, which proved to be the same we had crossed, was seen tumbling down in front, literally from out of the clouds. But this glimpse at our whereabouts was soon lost, and we were buried in the woods again. The wood was chiefly yellow birch, spruce, fir, mountain ash, or roundwood, as the main people called it, and moosewood. It was the worst kind of traveling, sometimes like the densest scrub oak patches with us. The cornel, or bunch berries, were very abundant, as well as Solomon's seal and mooseberries. Blueberries were distributed along our whole route, and in one place the bushes were drooping with the weight of the fruit, still as fresh as ever. It was the 7th of September. Such patches afforded a grateful repast, and served to bait the tired party forward. When any lagged behind, the cry of blueberries was most effectual to bring them up. Even at this elevation, we passed through a moose yard formed by a large flat rock four or five rods square where they tread down the snow in the winter. At length, fearing that if we held the direct course to the summit, we should not find any water near our camping ground, we gradually swerved to the west till at four o'clock we struck again the torrent which I have mentioned, and here, in view of the summit, the weary party decided to camp that night. While my companions were seeking a suitable spot for this purpose, I improved the little daylight that was left in climbing the mountain alone. We were in a deep and narrow ravine, sloping up to the clouds, at an angle of nearly 45 degrees, and hemmed in by walls of rock, which were at first covered with low trees, then with impenetrable thickets of scraggy bush birches and spruce trees and with moss, but at last bare of all vegetation but lichens and almost continually draped in clouds. Following up the course of the torrent which occupied this, and I mean to lay some emphasis on this word up, pulling myself up by the side of the perpendicular falls of twenty or thirty feet, by the roots of firs and birches, and then perhaps walking a level rod or two in the thin stream, for it took up the whole road, ascending by huge steps, as it were a giant stairway, down which a river flowed. I had soon cleared the trees and paused on the successive shelves, to look back over the country. The torrent was from 15 to 30 feet wide, without a tributary and seemingly not diminishing in breadth as I advanced. But still it came rushing and roaring down with a copious tide over and amidst masses of bare rock from the very clouds as though a water spout had just burst over the mountain. Leaving this at last, I began to work my way, scarcely less arduous than Satan's anciently through chaos, up the nearest, though not the highest, peak. At first, scrambling on all fours over the tops of ancient black spruce trees, old as the flood, from two to ten or twelve feet in height, their tops flat and spreading, and their foliage blue, and nipped with cold as if for centuries they had ceased growing upward against the bleak sky, the solid cold. I walked some good rods erect upon the tops of these trees, which were overgrown with moss and mountain cranberries. It seemed that in the course of time they had filled up the intervals between the huge rocks and the cold wind had uniformly leveled all over. Here, the principle of vegetation was hard put to it. There was apparently a belt of this kind running quite round the mountain, though perhaps nowhere so remarkable as here. 
Once, slumping through, I looked down ten feet into a dark and cavernous region and saw the stem of a spruce on whose top I stood as on a mass of coarse basket work fully nine inches in diameter at the ground. These holes were bear's dens, and the bears were even then at home. This was the sort of garden I made my way over for an eighth of a mile at the risk, it is true, of treading on some of the plants, not seeing any path through it. Certainly the most, most treacherous and porous country I ever traveled. Nigh foundered on he fares, treading the crude consistence, half on foot, half flying. But nothing could exceed the toughness of the twigs. Not one snapped under my weight, for they had slowly grown. Having slumped, scrambled, rolled, bounced, and walked by turns over this scraggy country, I arrived upon a side hill or rather side mountain, where rocks, gray, silent rocks, were the flocks and herds that pastured, chewing a rocky cud at sunset. They looked at me with hard gray eyes, without a bleat or a low. This brought me to the skirt of a cloud, and bounded my walk that night. But I had already seen that main country when I turned about, waving, flowing, rippling down below. When I returned to my companions, they had selected a camping ground on the torrent's edge and were resting on the ground. One was on the sick list, rolled in a blanket on a damp shelf of rock. It was a savage and dreary scenery enough, so wildly rough that they looked long to find a level and open space for the tent. We could not well camp higher for want of fuel, and the trees here seemed so evergreen and sappy that we almost doubted if they would acknowledge the influence of fire. But fire prevailed at last and blazed here too, like a good citizen of the world. Even at this height, we met with frequent traces of moose as well as of bears, as here was no cedar we made our bed of coarser feathered spruce, but at any rate the feathers were plucked from the live tree. It was, perhaps, even a more grand and desolate place for a night's lodging than the summit would have been, being in the neighborhood of those wild trees and of the torrent. Some more aerial and finer spirited winds rushed and roared through the ravine all night, from time to time arousing our fire and dispersing the embers about. It was as if we lay in the very nest of a young whirlwind. At midnight, one of my bedfellows, being startled in his dreams by the sudden blazing up to its top of a fir tree, whose green boughs were dried by the heat, sprang up with a cry from his bed, thinking the world on fire, and drew the whole camp after him. In the morning, after wetting our appetite on some raw pork, a wafer of hard bread, and a dipper of condensed cloud or water spout, we all together began to make our way up the falls, which I have described, this time choosing the right hand or highest peak, which was not the one I had approached before. But soon my companions were lost to my sight behind the mountain ridge in my rear which still seemed ever retreating before me. And I climbed alone over huge rocks, loosely poised a mile or more, still edging toward the clouds. For though the day was clear elsewhere, the summit was concealed by mist. The mountains seemed a vast aggregation of loose rocks, as if some time it had rained rocks, and they lay as they fell on the mountain sides. Nowhere fairly at rest, but leaning on each other, all rocking stones, with cavities between, but scarcely any soil or smoother shelf. They were the raw materials of a planet dropped from an unseen quarry, 
which the vast chemistry of nature would anon work up or work down into the smiling and verdant plains and valleys of earth. This was an undone extremity of the globe, as in lignite we see coal in the process of formation. At length I entered within the skirts of the cloud which seemed forever drifting over the summit, and yet would never be gone, but was generated out of that pure air as fast as it flowed away. And when, a quarter of a mile farther, I reached the summit of the ridge, which whose who have seen in clearer weather, say, is about five miles long, and contains a thousand acres of tableland. I was deep within the hostile ranks of clouds, and all objects were obscured by them. Now the wind would blow me out a, a yard of clear sunlight, wherein I stood. Then a gray, dawning light was all it could accomplish, the cloud line ever rising and falling with the wind's intensity. Sometimes it seemed as if the summit would be cleared in a few moments and smile in sunshine. But what was gained on one side was lost on another. It was like sitting in a chimney and waiting for the smoke to blow away. It was, in fact, a cloud factory. These were the cloud works, and the wind turned them off, done from the cool, bare rocks. Occasionally, when the windy columns broke into me, I caught sight of a dark, damp crag to the right or left, the mist driving ceaselessly between it and me. It reminded me of the creations of the old epic and dramatic poets of Atlas, Vulcan, the Cyclops, and Prometheus. Such was Caucasus and the rock where Prometheus was bound. Aeschylus had no doubt visited such scenery as this. It was vast, titanic, and such as man never inhabits. Some part of the beholder, even some vital part, seems to escape through the loose grating of his ribs as he ascends. He is more lone than you can imagine. There is less of substantial thought and fair understanding in him than in the plains where men inhabit. His reason is dispersed and shadowy, more thin and, s and subtle, like the air. Vast, titanic, inhuman nature has got him at disadvantage, caught him alone, and pilfers him of some of his divine faculty. She does not smile on him as in the plains. She seems to say sternly, Why came ye here before your time? This ground is not prepared for you. Is it not enough that I smile in the valleys? I have never made this soil for thy feet, this air for thy breathing, these rocks for thy neighbors. I cannot pity nor fondle thee here, but forever relentlessly drive thee hence to where I am kind. Why seek me where I have not called thee? and then complain because you find me but a stepmother. Shouldst thou freeze or starve or shudder thy life away, here is no shrine nor altar nor any access to my ear. Quote, Chaos and ancient night, I come no spy with purpose to explore or to disturb the secrets of your realm, but... As my way lies through your spacious empire up to light. Unquote. The tops of mountains are among the unfinished parts of the globe, whither it is a slight insult to the gods to climb and pry into their secrets and try their effect on our humanity. Only daring and insolent men perchance go there. Simple races, as savages, do not climb mountains. Their tops are sacred and mysterious tracks never visited by them. Pamela is always angry with those who climb to the summit of Katahdin. According to Jackson, who in his capacity of geological surveyor of the state, 
has accurately measured it. The altitude of Katahdin is 5,300 feet, or a little more than one mile above the level of the sea. And he adds, It is then evidently the highest point in the state of Maine, and is the most abrupt granite mountain in New England. The peculiarities of that spacious tableland on which I was standing, as well as the remarkable semicircle precipice or basin on the eastern side, were all concealed by the mist. I had brought my whole pack to the top, not knowing but I should have to make my descent to the river, and possibly to the settled portion of the state alone, and by some other route, and wishing to have a complete outfit with me. But at length, fearing that my companions would be anxious to reach the river before night, and knowing that the clouds might rest on the mountain for days, I was compelled to descend. Occasionally, as I came down, and wind would blow me a vista open, through which I could see the country eastward, boundless forests and lakes and streams gleaming in the sun, some of them and emptying into the east branch. There were also new mountains in sight in that direction. Now and then some small bird of the sparrow family would flit away before me, unable to command its course, like a fragment of the gray rock blown off by the wind. I found my companions where I had left them, on the side of the peak, gathering the mountain cranberries, which filled every crevice between the rocks, together with blueberries, which had a spicier flavor the higher up they grew, but were not the less agreeable to our palates. When the country is settled and roads are made, these cranberries will perhaps become an article of commerce. From this elevation, just on the skirts of the clouds, we could overlook the country west and south for a hundred miles. There it was, the state of Maine, which we had seen on the map, but not much like that. Immeasurable forest for the sun to shine on, that eastern stuff we hear of in Massachusetts. No clearing, no house. It did not look as if a solitary traveler had cut so many as a walking stick there. Countless lakes, Moosehead in the southwest, 40 miles long by 10 wide, like a gleaming silver platter at the end of the table. Chizunkuk, 18 long by 3 wide, without an island. Millinocket on the south, with its hundred islands, and a hundred others without a name and mountains also, whose names, for the most part, are known only to the Indians. The forest looked like a firm grass sward, and the effect of these lakes in its midst has been well compared by one who has since visited this same spot to that of a, quote, mirror broken into a thousand fragments and wildly scattered over the grass, reflecting the full blaze of sun, unquote. It was a large farm for somebody when cleared. According to the Gazetteer, which was printed before the boundary question was settled, this single Penobscot County in which we were was larger than the whole state of Ver Vermont with its 14 counties, and this was only a part of the wild lands of Maine. We are concerned now, however, about natural, not political limits. We were about 80 miles, as the bird flies, from Bangor, or 115, as we had ridden and walked and paddled. We had to console ourselves with the reflection that this view was probably as good as that from the peak, as far as it went. And what were a mountain without its attendant clouds and mists? Like ourselves, neither Bailey nor Jackson had obtained a clear view from the summit. Setting out on our return to the river, 
Still at an early hour in the day, we decided to follow the course of the torrent, which we supposed to be Merch Brook. As long as it would not lead us too far out of the way, we thus traveled about four miles in the very torrent itself, continually crossing and recrossing it, leaping from rock to rock, and jumping with the stream down falls of seven or eight feet, or sometimes sliding down on our backs in a thin sheet of water. This ravine had been the scene of an extraordinary freshet in the spring, apparently accompanied by a slide from the mountain. It must have been filled with a stream of stones and water at least twenty feet above the present levels of the torrent. For a rod or two on either side of its channel, the trees were barked and splintered up to their tops. The birches bent over, twisted, and sometimes finely split like a stable broom, some a foot in diameter, snapped off, and whole clumps of trees bent over with the weight of rocks piled on them. In one place we noticed a rock two or three feet in diameter, lodged nearly twenty feet high in the crotch of a tree. For the whole four miles we saw but one rill emptying in, and the volume of water did not seem to be increased from the first. We traveled thus very rapidly with a downward impetus, and grew remarkably expert at leaping from rock to rock, for leap we must, and leap we did, whether there was any rock at the right distance or not. It was a pleasant picture when the foremost turned about and looked up the winding ravine, walled in with rocks in the green forest, to see at intervals of a rod or two a red-shirted or green-jacketed mountaineer against the white torrent, leaping down the channel with his pack on his back or pausing upon a convenient rock in the midst of the torrent to mend a rent, mend a rent in his clothes or unstrap the dipper at his belt to take a draught of the water. At one place we were startled by seeing on a little sandy shelf by the side of the stream the fresh print of a man's foot, and for a moment realized how Robinson Crusoe felt in a similar case. But at last we remembered that we had struck this stream on our way up, though we could not have told where, and one had descended into the ravine for a drink. The cool air above and the continual bathing of our bodies in mountain water, alternate foot, sits, douche, and plunge baths made this walk exceedingly refreshing, and we had traveled only a mile or two after leaving the torrent before Every thread of our clothes was as dry as usual, owing perhaps to a peculiar quality in the atmosphere. After leaving the torrent, being in doubt about our course, Tom threw down his pack at the foot of the loftiest spruce tree at hand and shinned up the bare trunk some twenty feet and then climbed through the green tower lost to our sight until he held the topmost spray in his hand. McCoslin, in his younger days, had marched through the wilderness with a body of troops under General Somebody, and with one other man did all the scouting and spying service. The general's word was, throw down the top of that tree, and there was no tree in the main woods so high that it did not lose its top in such a case. I have heard a story of two men being lost once in these woods, nearer to the settlements than this, who climbed the loftiest pine they could find, some six feet in diameter at the ground, from whose top they discovered a solitary clearing and its smoke. When, at this height, some two hundred feet from the ground, one of them became dizzy and fainted in his companion's arms, and the latter had to accomplish the descent with him, alternately fainting and reviving as best he could. To Tom we cried, 
Where away does the summit bear? Where the burnt lands? The last he could only conjecture. He decried, however, a little meadow and pond lying probably in our course, which we concluded to steer for. On reaching this secluded meadow, we found fresh tracks of moose on the shore of the pond, and the water was still unsettled as if they had fled before us. A little farther in a dense thicket, we seemed to be still on their trail. It was a small meadow of a few acres on the mountainside, concealed by the forest and perhaps never seen by a white man before where one would think that the moose might browse and bathe and rest in peace. Pursuing this course, we soon reached the open land, which went sloping down some miles toward the Penobscot. Perhaps I most fully realized that this was primeval, untamed and forever untamable nature, or whatever else men call it, while coming down this part of the mountain. We were passing over burnt lands, burnt by lightning, perchance, though they showed no recent marks of fire, hardly so much as a charred stump, but looked rather like a natural pasture for the moose and deer, exceedingly wild and desolate, with occasional strips of timber crossing them and low poplars springing up, and patches of blueberries here and there. I found myself traversing them familiarly, like some pasture run to waste or partially reclaimed by man. But when I reflected what man, what brother or sister or kinsman of our race made it and claimed it, I expected the proprietor to rise up and dispute my passage. It is difficult to conceive of a region uninhabited by man. We habitually presume his presence and influence everywhere. And yet we have not seen pure nature unless we have seen her thus vast and drear and inhuman, though in the midst of cities. Nature was here something savage and awful, though beautiful. I looked with awe at the ground I trod on to see what the powers had made there the form and fashion and material of their work. This was what earth of which we have heard made out of chaos and old night. Here was no man's garden, but the unhandled globe. It was not lawn, nor pasture, nor mead, nor woodland, nor lay, nor arable, nor wasteland. It was the fresh and natural surface of the planet Earth, as it was made forever and ever, to be the dwelling of man, we say. So nature made it, and man may use it if he can. Man was not to be associated with it. It was matter, vast, terrific, not his mother Earth that we have heard of, not for him to tread on or be buried in. No, it were being too familiar even to let his bones lie there. The home, this, of necessity and fate. There was clearly felt the presence of a force not bound to be kind to man. It was a place for heathenism and superstitious rites. To be uninhabited by men nearer of kin to the rocks and to wild animals than we. We walked over it with a certain awe, stopping from time to time to pick the blueberries which grew there and had a smart and spicy taste. Perchance, where our wild pines stand and leaves lie on their forest floor, in Concord there were once reapers and husbandmen planted grain, but here not even the surface had been scarred by man but it was a specimen of what God saw fit to make this world. What is it to be admitted to a museum, to see a myriad of particular things compared with being shown some star's surface, some hard matter in its home? I stand in awe of my body. This matter to which I am bound has become so strange to me. 
I fear not spirits, ghosts of which I am one, that my body might, but I fear bodies, I tremble to meet them. What is this titan that has possession of me? Talk of mysteries? Think of our life in nature, daily to be shown matter, to come in contact with it, rocks, trees, winds on our cheeks, the solid earth, the actual world, the common sense, contact, contact, who are we, where are we? Ere long we recognize some rocks and other features in the landscape which we had purposely impressed on our memories, and quickening our pace by two o'clock, we reach the bateau. Here we had expected to dine on trout, but in this glaring sunlight they were slow to take the bait, so we were compelled to make the most of the crumbs of our hard bread and our pork, which were both nearly exhausted. Meanwhile, we deliberated whether we should go up the river a mile farther to Gibson's clearing on the Sawednahunk, where there was a deserted log hut in order to get a half-inch auger to mend one of our spike poles with. There were young spruce trees enough around us, and we had a spare spike, but nothing to make a hole with. But as it was uncertain whether we should find any tools left, we patched up the broken pole as well as we could for the downward voyage in which there would be but little use for it. Moreover, we were unwilling to lose any time in this expedition, lest the wind should rise before we reached the larger lakes and detain us for a moderate wind produces quite a sea on these waters, in which a bateau will not live for a moment, and on one occasion McCausland had been delayed a week at the head of the North Twin, which is only four miles across. We were nearly out of provisions and ill-prepared in this respect for what might possibly prove a week's journey round by the shore, fording, innumerable streams and threading a trackless forest should any accident happen to our boat. It was with regret that we turned our backs on Chisuncook, which McCausland had formerly logged on, and the Allagash Lakes. There were still longer rapids and portages above. Among the last, the Ripogenus portage, which he described as the most difficult on the river and three miles long. The whole length of the Penobscot is 270 miles, and we are still nearly 100 miles from its source. Hodge, the assistant state geologist, passed up this river in 1837 and by a portage of only one mile and three quarters crossed over into the Allagash and so went down that into the St. John, and up the Madawaska to the Grand Portage across to the St. Lawrence. His is the only account that I know of an expedition through to Canada in this direction. He thus describes his first sight of the latter river, which, to compare small things with great, is like Balboa's first sight of the Pacific from the mountains of the Isthmus of Darien. Quote, when we first came in sight of the St. Lawrence, he says, from the top of a high hill, the view was most striking and much more interesting to me from having been shut up in the woods for the two previous months. Directly before us lay the broad river extending across nine or ten miles its surface broken by a few islands and reefs and two ships riding at anchor near the shore, beyond extended ranges of uncultivated hills parallel with the river. The sun was just going down behind them and gilding the whole scene with its parting rays." Unquote. About four o'clock the same afternoon, we commenced our return voyage which would require but little, if any, poling. In shooting rapids, the boatmen used large and broad paddles instead of poles to guide the boat with. 
though we glided so swiftly and often smoothly down where it had cost us no slight effort to get up, our present voyage was attended with far more danger. For if we once fairly struck one of the thousand rocks by which we were surrounded, the boat would be swamped in an instant. When a boat is swamped under these circumstances, the boatmen commonly find no difficulty in keeping afloat at first, for the current keeps both them and their cargo up for a long way down the stream. And if they can swim, they have only to work their way gradually to the shore. The greatest danger is of being caught in an eddy behind some larger rock, where the water rushes upstream faster than elsewhere it does down, and being carried round and round under the surface till they are drowned. McCausland pointed out some rocks which had been the scene of a fatal accident of this kind. Sometimes the body is not thrown out for several hours. He himself had performed such a circuit once, only his legs being visible to his companions. But he was fortunately thrown out in season to recover his breath. In shooting the rapids, the boatman has this problem to solve to choose a circuitous and safe course amid a thousand sunken rocks scattered over a quarter or half a mile at the same time that he is moving steadily on at the rate of 15 miles an hour. Stop, he cannot. The only question is, where will he go? The bowman chooses the course with all his eyes about him, striking broad off with his paddle and drawing the boat by main force into her course. The stern man faithfully follows the bow. We were soon at the Abel Jacarmigas Falls. Anxious to avoid the delay as well as the labor of the portage here, our boatmen went forward first to Reconnaitre and concluded to let the bateau down the falls, carrying the baggage only over the portage. Jumping from rock to rock until nearly in the middle of the stream, we were ready to receive the boat and let her down over the first fall, some six or seven feet perpendicular. The boatmen stand upon the edge of a shelf of rock where the fall is perhaps nine or ten feet perpendicular, in from one to two feet of rapid water, one on each side of the boat, and let it slide gently over till the bow is run out ten or twelve feet in the air, then letting it drop squarely while one holds the painter, the other leaps in, and his companion following, they are whirled down the rapids to a new fall or to smooth water. In a very few minutes they had accomplished a passage in safety, which would be as foolhardy for the unskillful to attempt as the descent of Niagara itself. It seemed as if it needed only a little familiarity and a little more skill to navigate down such falls as Niagara itself with safety. At any rate, I should not despair of such men in the rapids above Table Rock until I saw them actually go over the falls, so cool, so collected, so fertile in resources are they. One might have thought that these falls and that falls were not to be waded through with impunity like a mud puddle. There was really danger of their losing their sublimity and losing their power to harm us. Familiarity breeds contempt. The boatman pauses, perchance on some shelf beneath a table rock under the fall, standing in some cove of backwater two feet deep, and you hear his rough voice come up through the spray, coolly giving directions how to launch the boat this time. Having carried round Pockwockamus Falls, our oars soon brought us to the Katapskanigan, or Oak Hall Carry, where we decided to camp halfway over, leaving our bateau to be carried over in the morning on fresh shoulders. One shoulder of each of the boatmen showed a red spot as large as one's hand, 
worn by the bateau on this expedition. And this shoulder, as it did all the work, was perceptibly lower than its fellow from long service. Such toil soon wears out the strongest constitution. The drivers are accustomed to work in the cold water in the spring, rarely ever dry, and if one falls in all over, he rarely changes his clothes till night, if then even. One who takes this precaution is called by a particular nickname or is turned off. None can lead this life who are not almost amphibious. McCausland said soberly, what is at any rate a good story to tell, that he had seen where six men were wholly underwater at once, at a jam with their shoulders to hand spikes. If the log did not start, then they had to put out their heads to breathe. The driver works as long as he can see, from dark to dark, and at night has not time to eat his supper and dry his clothes fairly before he is asleep on his cedar bed. We lay that night on the very bed made by such a party, stretching our tent over the poles which were still standing, but re-shingling the damp and faded bed with fresh leaves. In the morning we carried our boat over and launched it, making haste lest the wind should rise. And the boatman ran down Pasigamet, and soon after Ambijiji's Falls, while we walked around with the baggage. We made a hasty breakfast at the head of Ambijiji's Lake on the remainder of our pork, and were soon rowing across its smooth surface again under a pleasant sky, the mountain being now clear of clouds in the northeast. Taking turns at the oars, we shot rapidly across the deep cove, the foot of Pamadumcook, and the north twin at the rate of six miles an hour, the wind not being high enough to disturb us, and reached the dam at noon. The boatman went through one of the log sluices in the bateau, where the fall was ten feet at the bottom and took us in below. Here was the longest rapid in our voyage, and perhaps the running this was as dangerous and arduous a task as any, shooting down sometimes at the rate, as we judged, of fifteen miles an hour. If we struck a rock, we were split from end to end in an instant. Now, like a bait bobbing for some river monster amid the eddies, now darting to this side of the stream, now to that, gliding swift and smooth near to our destruction, or striking broad off with the paddle and drawing the boat to right or left with all our might in order to avoid a rock. I suppose that it was like running the rapids of the Salt Saint Marie at the outlet of Lake Superior, and our boatmen probably displayed no less dexterity than the Indians there do. We soon ran through this mile and floated in Quakish Lake. After such a voyage, the troubled and angry waters, which once had seemed terrible and not to be trifled with, appeared tamed and subdued. They had been bearded and worried in their channels, pricked and whipped into submission with the spike pole and paddle, gone through and through with impunity, and all their spirit and their danger taken out of them. And the most swollen and impetuous rivers seemed but playthings henceforth. I began at length to understand the boatman's familiarity with and contempt for the rapids. Quote, those Fowler boys, said Mrs. McCoslin, are perfect ducks for the water, unquote. They had run down to Lincoln, according to her, 30 or 40 miles in a bateau in the night for a doctor, when it was so dark that they could not see a rod before them, and the river was so swollen so as to be almost a continuous rapid so that the doctor cried, when they brought him up by daylight. Why, Tom, how did you see to steer? We didn't steer much, only kept her straight. 
and yet they met with no accident. It is true. The more difficult rapids are higher up than this. When we reached the Millinocket opposite to Tom's house and were waiting for his folks to set us over, for we had left our bateau above the Grand Falls, we discovered two canoes with two men in each turning up this stream from Shad Pond, one keeping the opposite side of a small island before us while the other approached the side where we were standing examining the banks carefully for muskrats as they came along. The last proved to be Louis Neptune and his companion, now at last on their way up to Chizunkuk after Moose. But they were so disguised that we hardly knew them. At a little distance they might have been taken for Quakers, with their broad-brimmed hats and overcoats with broad capes the spoils of Bangor seeking a settlement in this Sylvania, or nearer at hand for fashionable gentlemen the morning after a spree. Met face to face, these Indians in their native woods looked like the sinister and slouching fellows whom you meet picking up strings and papers in the streets of a city. There is, in fact, a remarkable and unexpected resemblance between the degraded savage and the lowest classes in a great city. The one is no more a child of nature than the other. In the progress of degradation, the distinction of races is soon lost. Neptune at first was only anxious to know what we kill, seeing some partridges in the hands of one of the party but we had assumed too much anger to permit of a reply. We thought Indians had some honor before, but me been sick. Oh, me unwell now. You make b bargain, then me go. They had in fact been delayed so long by a drunken frolic at the Five Islands, and they had not yet recovered from its effects. They had some young musquash in their canoes, which they dug out of the banks with a hoe, for food, not for their skins, for musquash are their principal food on these expedition. They went on up the Millinocket, and we kept down the bank of the Penobscot, after recruiting ourselves with a draught of Tom's beer, leaving Tom at his home. Thus a man shall lead his life away here, on the edge of the wilderness, on Indian Millinocket stream in a new world, far in the dark of a continent, and have a flute to play at evening here, while his strains echo to the stars amid the howling of wolves, shall live, as it were, in primitive age of the world, a primitive man. Yet he shall spend a sunny day, and in this century, by my contemporary, perchance shall read some scattered leaves of literature, and sometimes talk with me. Why read history, then, if the ages and the generations are now? He lives three thousand years deep into time, an age not yet described by poets. Can you well go further back in history than this? I, I. For there turns up but now into the mouth of Millinocket stream a still more ancient and primitive man, whose history is not brought down even to the former, in a bark vessel sown with the roots of the spruce, with hornbeam paddles he dips his way along. He is but dim and misty to me, obscured by the eons that lie between the bark canoe and the bateau. He builds no house of logs, but a wigwam of skins. He eats no hot bread and sweet cake, but musquash and moose meat and the fat of bears. He glides up the Millinocket and is lost to my sight as a more distant and misty cloud is seen flitting by behind a nearer and is lost in space. So he goes about his destiny, the red face of man. After having passed the night and buttered our boots for the last time at Uncle George's, whose dogs almost devoured him for joy at his return, 
We kept on down the river the next day, about eight miles on foot, and then took a bateau with a man to pull it to Matawamkeg, ten more. At the middle of that very night, to make a swift conclusion to a long story, we dropped our buggy over the half-finished bridge at Old Town, where we heard the confused din and clink of a hundred saws, which never rest, and at six o'clock the next morning, one of the party was steaming his way to Massachusetts. What is most striking in the Maine wilderness is the continuousness of the forest with fewer open intervals or glades than you had imagined. Except the few burnt lands, the narrow intervals on the river, the bare tops of the high mountains, and the lakes and streams, the forest is uninterrupted. It is even more grim and wild than you had anticipated, a damp and intricate wilderness. In the spring, everywhere wet and miry, the aspect of the country indeed is universally stern and savage, excepting the distant views of the forest from hills and the lake prospects, which are mild and civilizing in a degree. The lakes are something which you are unprepared for. They lie up so high, exposed to the light, and the forest is diminished to a fine fringe on their edges, with here and there a blue mountain, like amethyst jewels set around some jewel of the first water. So interior, so superior to all the changes that are to take place on their shores. Even now civil and refined and fair as they can ever be, these are not artificial forests of an English king, a royal preserve merely. Here prevail no forest laws but those of nature. The aborigines have never been dispossessed, nor nature disforested. It is a country full of evergreen trees, of mossy silver birches and watery maples, the ground dotted with insipid small red berries, and strewn with damp and moss-grown rocks, a country diversified with innumerable lakes and rapid streams, peopled with trout and various species of leucusiae, with salmon, shad, and pickerel, and other fishes, the forest resounding at rare intervals with the note of the chickadee, the blue jay, and the woodpecker, the scream of the fish hawk and the eagle, the laugh of the loon and the whistle of ducks along the solitary streams. At night, with the hooting of owls and howling of wolves, in summer swarming with myriads of black flies and mosquitoes, more formidable than wolves to the white man. Such is the home of the moose, the bear, the caribou, the wolf, the beaver, and the Indian, who shall describe the inexpressible tenderness and immortal life of the grim forest, where nature, though it be midwinter, is ever in her spring, where the moss-grown and decaying trees are not old, but seem to enjoy a perpetual youth, and blissful, innocent nature, like a serene infant, is too happy to make a noise, except by a few tinkling, lisping birds and trickling rills. What a place to live, what a place to die and be buried in. There certainly men would live forever and laugh at death in the grave. There they could have no such thoughts as are associated with the village graveyard, that make a grave out of one of those moist evergreen hummocks. Die and be buried who will, I mean to live here still. My nature grows ever more young, the primitive pines among. I am reminded by my journey how exceedingly new this country still is. You have only to travel for a few days into the interior and back parts even of many of the old states to come to that very America which the Northmen and Cabot and Gosnold and Smith and Raleigh visited. If 
Columbus was the first to discover the islands, Americus Vespucius and Cabot and the Puritans, and we, their descendants, have discovered only the shores of America. While the Republic has already acquired a history worldwide, America is still unsettled and unexplored. Like the English in New Holland, we live only on the shores of a continent even yet, and hardly know where the rivers come from which float our navy. The very timber and boards and shingles of which our houses are made grew but yesterday in a wilderness where the Indian still hunts and the moose runs wild. New York has her wilderness within her own borders, and though the sailors of Europe are familiar with the soundings of her Hudson and Fulton long since invented the steamboat on its waters, an Indian is still necessary to guide her scientific men to its headwaters in the Adirondack country. Have we even so much as discovered and settled the shores? Let a man travel on foot along the coast from the Passamaquoddy to the Sabine or to the Rio Bravo or to wherever the end is now, if he is swift enough to overtake it, faithfully following the windings of every inlet and of every cape and stepping to the music of the surf with a desolate fishing town once a week and a city's port once a month to cheer him, and putting up at the lighthouses when there are any, and tell me if it looks like a discovered and settled country and not rather, for the most part, like a desolate island and no man's land. We have advanced by leaps to the Pacific, and left many a lesser Oregon and California unexplored behind us. Though the railroad and the telegraph have been established on the shores of Maine, the Indian still looks out from her interior mountains over all these to the sea. There stands the city of Bangor, 50 miles up the Penobscot, at the head of navigation for vessels of the largest class the principal lumber depot on this continent, with a population of 12,000, like a star on the edge of night, still hewing at the forest of which it is built, already overflowing with the luxuries and refinement of Europe, and sending its vessels to Spain, to England, and to the West Indies for its groceries. And yet only a few axemen have gone upriver into the howling wilderness which feeds it. The bear and deer are still found within its limits, and the moose, as he swims the Penobscot, is entangled amid its shipping and taken by foreign sailors in its harbor. Twelve miles in the rear, twelve miles of railroad, are Orno and the Indian Island, the home of the Penobscot tribe, and then commence the bateau and the canoe and military road, and 60 miles above the country is virtually unmapped and unexplored, and there still waves the virgin forest of the new world.